Good morning. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so first thing is I posted an updated set of the notebooks in the uh, simulation channel on Slack. So that would be where you would get the code we're going to work through today. I apologize. I am currently locked out of my GitHub account, so I'm not able to post them. But if anybody wants to post to your GitHub and share, I'm not asking you to, but if you happen to drop it in your GitHub, I have no objections to that. Um, and they will be posted on Git as soon as I have my access straightened out. Okay, so um, this tutorial is kind of a collection of all sorts of things you might think about when you think, how can I get my hands either on some data with a particular structure or to test a particular algorithm, or I have some data, but I don't have enough data, or I don't have very good data, and is there anything I can do to sort of get a little bit more out of the same data set uh, without straight up making things up, because obviously that won't be very useful as a data supplementation tactic. So that is the goal of this tutorial. Here's an outline of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, we're first going to just talk fairly generally about simulating random numbers. I am in no way a, a math theory person, so this will be very limited, uh, but just good to have a sense of what the problems are and what people who actually work in that field think about. Uh, We'll just be talking about simulating from a model fairly generally, drawing from different distributions and what does that look like and how does that relate to random numbers. We're also going to talk a bit about agent-based simulations and look at uh, a particular Python package, SimP, that can help you with this. We're going to look at a science slash physics simulation to get another idea of sort of what simulation can look like and how that can generate data for you. And finally, we're going to finish by discussing how we can augment uh, data sets. Okay, so let's start off by, uh, and actually before we get started, I just want to mention a few things. So I hope everyone will feel free to come and go whenever you want to, to get a snack, use the bathroom, whatever it is. Don't feel self-conscious about that. Uh, don't feel self-conscious about interrupting me if something is not clear or if you need more time or anything like that. Um, any other logistics we should talk about? Any questions? Yes. So the channel is called simulating, yes. And actually, it's pretty important that everyone have the, the zip file. Is anybody not on Slack or didn't find the channel? OK, so uh, if you're not on Slack and you haven't been on Slack yet and you need an invite, in that case, you would, uh, you would email scipy at and dot, uh, is it dot org or dot com? Or? .com, at nthought.com, I think it's .com. Um, they will respond almost instantly and get you a new Slack invitation. Yes, yeah, so if, if somebody wants to do that, like I said, I'm, I just can't get into my GitHub right now. So if somebody can readily post that, that would be appreciated. And if you do, please post that to your Slack. But if that's not an easy option for everyone, then yes. Yeah, so that's the problem is I haven't been able to establish a repository because I'm locked out due to some OAuth 2 issues. Long story. Uh, so if somebody else wanted to create the repository, feel free to do it is what I'm saying. But I have provided them as a zip file in the Slack channel. Other questions? Okay. Um, and then I guess actually it would be helpful for me to know a little bit about people's backgrounds. Um, so if you could raise your hand if you generally have to use synthetic data in one way or another for your work. OK, and so for those of you who do, what does that look like? What kinds of data do you make? So you need, you need ages of survey respondents in some kind of normal or truncated normal distribution, something like that? Ah, OK. Is that, uh, is that the usual use case? Does anyone do anything else? OK, fair enough. Um, who works in what you would describe as like a science field? OK, and who works in what you would not describe as a science field? Couple. Me too, so. Um, and just one question for fun, which I always ask, is who thinks they came the furthest to get here? Australia. Can anyone beat Australia? That's pretty amazing. Yesterday I had Singapore. I'm not sure which of you wins, but they're both 
Very far, very far. Okay. Yeah, so that's part of why this is such a great conference. We get people from all over the world. It's fantastic. Okay, so now let's get started. Other, anything before we jump in? Okay. I will try to, uh, during breaks and such, check the Slack channel, but otherwise if you have questions or want to get my attention, it's best to just raise your hand. Okay, so let's talk about generating random numbers. Um, really when people talk about generating random numbers, like we're going to generate them with a computer, you're really talking about generating pseudo-random numbers, not random, number not random numbers. So you're really going to, instead of seeing like an RNG, when people talk about this, you usually see PRNG, pseudo-random number generator. Um, even settling for pseudo-random, though, is actually not that easy, right? You might say, oh, well, I just I made the task easier, so it shouldn't be so bad. It's actually still really complicated. Um, it often involves things that like data analysts and scientists themselves don't do very often, such as bit shifting, modulus, and exponential operations. Um, not just are these operations we don't tend to be familiar with because they don't tend to be relevant to data analysis. Um, some of these, like modulus and exponential, can be quite expensive if you're doing them a lot, right? So generating random numbers or pseudo random numbers is also computationally not cheap. Um, over time, uh, sort of a corpus of tests for randomness has emerged. Yes? Uh, we have a couple of posts on the slide. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, thanks for calling my attention to that. Yeah, so anyone who doesn't want to get it off the Slack or doesn't have the Slack, um, I will put one up there. So thank you very much for those who did it. So. Um, we have one GitHub is, I'm just going with the first one, A-N-C-P-L-P-W-J. Looks like that. Okay, so thank you very much to the two folks who posted. Much appreciated. Okay, um, so over time, a corpus of tests for randomness has uh, emerged because the other thing to remember is randomness is not exactly like being even or odd or being prime, right? It doesn't have just one definition. That's some easy to state, succinct mathematical test. Okay, so uh, what does a pseudo random number generator look like? Well, I definitely wouldn't attempt to write one, especially one that I would like sort of put up and say this is definitely correct. Uh, so I instead just, browsed GitHub and found examples of ones that people put into Python. Here's an example of what's called the XOR shift uh, algorithm. This one is one, if you go to Stack Overflow and you say, what is a pseudo random number generator I can do in my head or I can do uh, maybe with my fingers or some pencil and paper? Uh, this is the one people will give you, but actually if you look at it, it's still pretty complicated, right? It still involves um, all sorts of weird things like exponentials and um, sort of juggling multiple numbers, right? And you sort of juggle multiple numbers, do various uh, modulus operations on them, and out pops a random number. The important thing to know is that random numbers, for example, don't even come out of your head. So like pulling one out of your head turns out to be a terrible idea. They also do experiments on that. Uh, if you pull a random number out of your head, you'll usually gravitate to something like 7 or 17 or something that ends with a 7 because we all think, oh, those tend to be prime and primes feel like a little bit more random or a little bit more mathy. Uh, yeah, so true story. So anyway, when you're, when you're thinking about how to generate even a pseudo-random number, don't introspect. Okay, so what are, for example, some ways that people have thought about randomness? And this is, this is really a fairly new field, uh, really has a lot to do with the increasing power and availability of computation, right? So people in the 20s, I mean, sure, they were worried about cryptography, but they didn't worry nearly as much about randomness as we do now. Uh, so in 1995, people came up with what were called the diehard tests. This is not the be-all, end-all test of randomness, but it's one example to show you how uh, people who are de designing pseudo-random number generators think about these things. So this is just a sample. This is like a whole suite of tests, um, but these, these are sort of some of the intuitively understandable ones. So one is choose some random points from a generated sequence, right? So set up your pseudo-random number generator, kick it off, get some points, and then look at the distance, right? So you put them all in a bag after you generated them, you pull them out, now look at where the ones you selected were in the sequence that you originally generated. And they should be exponentially distributed in the distance, right? So the distance between these points 
should follow an exponential distribution. How do they know that? They had to figure out that that's what it should look like, right? So it's not enough to just crunch the numbers. They also have to think still theoretically about what does a random number look like. This is one way they test it, right? So first you have your whole sequence, then you put them in a bag and draw from the bag, and then you look at the distances. Uh, now this one I, I personally find confusing, not that it's not possible, but then I think, okay, well you have to put them in a bag and then draw from them, but then you also yet again need a way to do that randomly. Right? So even your tests of your pseudo-random number generator might require you to have some source of randomness. Right? So it's also sort of a turtles all the way down situation. Um, another example, I, and, and these are really interesting because they're so clever and kind of intuitive. Uh, so consider sequences of the same five numbers when they occur consecutively. Right? So you run your random number generator, blah, 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 thousands, tens of thousands, millions of times. And then you think of five particular numbers that you would, you know, that should occur in your sequence somewhere, and you look for when they occur in a row, right? It's almost like a word or something, right? Like these five numbers, when they occur all consecutively, in any order, they should occur in all orders with the same frequency, right? So, or you can think about it in terms of letters instead, right? Like if I were to permute A, B, C, D, E, I expect to see all permutations of A, B, C, D, E with the same frequency. It's the same rule for these random numbers. If I have five, when I see them together, I expect consecutively, I expect to see each order, right? And if I don't, that's, you know, that's a, a ding or whatever. Now to be clear, many pseudo-random number generators do not pass all these tests. There are many, many tests, and this is sort of one of these things where you have to think about your application and what's important to you. But uh, this is another way that these things do get tested, and many sort of proposed algorithms will fail, right? This is actually really complicated to make sure this sort of behavior will emerge in your system. Okay, and, and last example. Uh, in this case, what they want you to do is multiply 2 to the 31 by random floats on the range 0 to 1 until you reach 1. The number of floats needed to reach 1, right, the number of times you need to generate a random number and do this, this should follow a certain known distribution when you repeat this experiment thousands of times. Uh, so again, very computationally taxing and complicated just to think about testing this, right? So now I have to generate many random numbers uh, multiply them all by 2 to the 31 until I make it sufficiently small, count how many times I did that, and that's just one point in a distribution, do it enough times to establish a distribution, and make sure that distribution looks correct. That's another test. Uh, so even now, in 2019, this sounds daunting to do, at least to me, with the computers I have available, so I'm, I'm having a hard time even envisioning doing this in 1995, but they did. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, which tests a pseudo-random number generator does well on or doesn't do well on will sort of vary. It's a little bit like people, right? Like some of us are good at math but not so great at chemistry, and others of us are amazing dancers but not really good at basketball or whatever, right? Pseudo-random number generators also have sort of a mix and match of ability and strengths. Okay, so what are some other problems we run into other than sort of failing these die-hard tests? Um, some of these can have sort of surprisingly short periods. So they have, like, every pseudo-random number generator will have a period, right? That's why it's pseudo-random, is because it will eventually come back to itself in some way, and that's the period. Uh, some of these, one problem you can run into is they'll have surprisingly short periods if you have a bad seed. And the problem is, is that not every seed can be tested on every pseudo-random number generator. Uh, so these are problems, these aren't just sort of theoretical problems, these are problems people run into in code bases and sometimes realize, oh, we put this in 20 years ago and we're just noticing that actually there's a problem and maybe that explains some other things, or, oh, normally this was fine, but this one time we set the wrong seed and it was a disaster and then we discovered a bug. So these, you know, when you work in this field, you're sort of never free from worrying if this is going to come back to you. Um, so you can have this sort of bad seed problem that will reveal new problems with your underlying process. Uh, successive values can be correlated. This is also a big problem, right? And it tends to be that sort of the more efficient or easier your random number generator is, uh, for the obvious reason, that tends to mean that uh, your samples are more correlated because you are in some way trying to use that information to save yourself some time later. You can also have things like poor distributions along different dimensions in an output sequence, right? So if you're trying to generate high dimensional random data, uh, but you have this pseudo-random number generator that has maybe a short cycle or has this correlation or something, in some way you can have problems where uh, the dimensionality distribution is not really right. Like the distribution along one dimension doesn't match the distribution along the other, even though it should, purely because of these numerical cycling issues. And then as I mentioned, but I'll, I'll say again, flaws can go undetected for decades. 
as problems can be quite subtle or they can be limited to special cases. So we can be fairly sure, even with the PRNGs that are out there now, that there are probably flaws. Do those flaws matter for most of our purposes? Uh, I don't think so, right? For those of us who maybe work in some sort of high security type stuff where you really need random random, maybe. Uh, for purposes of simulation and things like that, it's probably not going to change your life or your analysis outcomes. Okay, um, so what's another option? This is what I would do. Like if, if I were suddenly, my livelihood depended on having a random number and I'm not a mathematician, I wouldn't go down that route. I would do the easy thing. I would try to find a truly random state in nature, right? Some sort of physical source of randomness. Uh, so companies do this, people do this. Um, there are websites online that will even give you sequences of random numbers that they themselves have generated, say from a balloon floating over the North Pole or what have you. Uh, so you can look at uh, minuscule fluctuations, say, in temperature, or atmospheric electromagnetic variations, or some combination of those. Um, if you don't have access to a balloon over uh, the South Pole or whatever, and, and sometimes you need to pay for such services, which is reasonable, right? They are providing a physical uh, service to you. Uh, so if you don't want to pay, you can also look for sources of randomness, for example, on your computer. So sometimes things like time between keystrokes, or random bits in a physical memory location on your hard drive that is frequently overridden and changing can be used as a source of random uh, data. So what are some problems with these physical or sort of semi-physical sources? Um, one problem is sort of bias, right? So for example, uh, sensors aren't perfect either. So if I put some sort of temperature uh, sensor into the atmosphere or EM sensor of some kind, that device itself can have some kind of bias, right? Or the distribution, even if it doesn't have a bias, the physical distribution of what we're looking at uh, might not be what I want it to be, right? Maybe I want uniform, but most physical distributions in nature are going to look more like a normal. Um, and maybe, it, you know, maybe it's not quite a normal and it's something else. So I'm transforming it, assuming it's a normal and I want a uniform, but actually uh, it's a beta distribution and you know, I shouldn't be transforming it the way I, I am. So you can still run into problems even with this gold standard of like a physical source. And for that reason, if you really want to get it right again, it still needs a lot of calibration and examination. And it's always possible you'll find issues later. Uh, so that's, that's all the downer spiel. But now that we've had that, I actually want to take the opposite approach and sort of look at some of the code base in Python where we are uh, generating random numbers when we use these just in our sort of daily coding lives to see actually that Despite the problems, this stuff is uh, interesting to look at, quite approachable, and you know, quite, quite relevant. So if we look at the first notebook, generating random numbers, we're going to just start with um, the random module. So sorry, that is in the, let's see. It's called the Random Numbers and Simulating from Statistical Models folder. So we'll be in that folder for the first two sets of notebooks. So um, it's in the Slack channel. There's a zip file. And if you unpack the zip file, it's in there. Or you can get it from GitHub at this address. OK, so other questions? OK, so let's jump right into it. Uh, so how do we use a pseudo-random number generator? Well, actually, I think we all have. I think it's, it would be very unlikely that anyone in this room has not already used these functions, right? Uh, you invariably need a random number for something or other, maybe just to settle a bet with your friend. Uh, so if we have from random, import seed random. If we set a seed, the point of this random number generator is that we will then have the same sequence, right? So for example, if you look at example code in textbooks, they'll sometimes set a seed just so you can make sure that you get what they got. Um, you might set a seed if you're trying to share analysis with somebody and you're using some sort of algorithm that has a random element to it and so on. Um, when you're setting a seed though, you are using a pseudo random number generator, right? And that's the whole point is it will have this deterministic outcome. Unlike if you were to set a seed, with a physical sensor, that doesn't actually mean anything, right? Whatever I could possibly translate as a seed for my physical sensor, like I plug it in and like refresh it or whatever, doesn't matter in a truly random system. OK. Um, so first exercise for you all is just what kind of distribution is generated with this baseline random? Because this baseline random is not even labeled, right? We sometimes just whip this out and use it, but sometimes maybe we don't give any thought to what that underlying distribution looks like. So go ahead and just plot that for yourself. 
take a minute. Okay, so I, um, I also wanted to mention that we have two assistants in the room who are available should you have any help, uh, technical questions or coding questions or what have you. So uh, just raise your hand and one of us will come to you. There's three people in the room who can assist with questions. Okay. Okay, so um, what kind of distribution is generated? There's uh, many ways you could do this. I decided I would just go ahead and generate a thousand samples and look at a histogram. And if I look at this histogram, what do I get? What does that look like? Yeah. Uniform distribution, which is what we would expect, right? So we should be a little bit worried if we don't see that. And we would expect it to be more and more like the sort of paradigm of the uniform distribution uh, with the more points we sample from it. OK. So where do these random numbers come from in the random package, right? If we're wondering where do they get their package from, um, if you look at the source code, you will see at least two options for your pseudo-random number generator. So in the next example, I've got, uh, I've got this code. I've got it commented out just so I don't accidentally uh, you know, mess up my base functions that are loaded. Uh, but you know, the nice thing about this sort of code base is firstly, they will tell you where your functions come from, right? So they tell you, oh, well, you can find this um, in this book on these pages, right? So really beautiful, well-documented code. And we can also um, see this algorithm. And I would first actually point you to the wiki page. So I'm going to just load the wiki page so you can see that as well. It's a little bit easier to read. Um, but basically what we see here is that we, um, in this algorithm, we're tracking three numbers. And we're basically performing a modulus and an, uh, a multiplication operation. And that is giving us our, uh, our random number. And then we sort of update everything. And it's, it's a bit of a cycle, right? So S1, S2, S3 are equal to the modulus of the previous F, S1, S2, S3 times 171, 172, 170, and then each one with its own divisor. Um, then you combine these, take another modulus. This will get you a pseudo-random number uh, generated sequence. And this also has sort of known statistical properties, right? So if you were to read up in this on Wiki or in other places, they can tell you sort of the approximate period, the approximate sort of faults in the algorithm. So if that were something that were relevant, you would know that right off the bat as well. Uh, so this is a really accessible algorithm. We can see uh, it's implemented in something like four or five lines. We can also see here that um, even with something like generating random numbers, the object-oriented aspect of Python is really useful, right? You can just slap a self on everything and you're storing it. Okay, so that's one way you could get a pseudo-random number generator in the random package. The other way that you will see the random package getting a pseudo-random number is from the operating system, right? So if you go to the next cell, I have this. Um, in this case, basically what you're using is you are using the OS module, which will access whatever source of random data your operating system makes available. Now, different operating systems will use different physical um, inputs to decide this. As I mentioned, sometimes it might use your keystrokes or other behavior. Uh, more likely is it's just going to look at uh, some chunk of memory or some you know, randomly selected chunks of memory over time and just read off the binary values in there. So either of these can be used uh, in the random module. OK. So what if you want to uh, generate integers, though? right? What we've been looking at so far appears to just be giving us a random uniform distribution from 0 to 1. Uh, but as we know, we can also generate integers. And that works really nicely as well. So what does that look like? Uh, take a few minutes to look at this next bit of source code in the next uh, cell, and then we will talk about this. But take a look here and, and basically look for where, where does it become an integer and how does it get the range correct. <laughs> 
Okay, so what do you what do you notice is going on here? What does it start with as its source of a random number? Mm hmm. So everything in this package is built off of that self dot random. That's so that's one of the first interesting things about the architecture of this package. At the end of the day. The main problem is still just getting that first random number, which is coming from that 0, 1 distribution. And then everything else to get some other kind of distribution or result is going to build off of that, right? So if we look, um, if we look around here, we will see that self.random, right? So that's where we are accessing that self.random. And what variables is that interacting with? Well, there's sort of a start and a stop, right? You want to have your integer range. And there's also a step size, right, if you don't want to sample uh, uniformly. And basically, it works just the way you would expect, right? It sort of uses that random number to sort of earmark where you should be along this integer range by multiplying by the actual random number. And then it applies the int function to just truncate. And it does this in a way that it's sort of aware that you're not truncating in a dumb way where you would somehow uh, cut off one edge and not have enough of that edge, right? Which is something you'd have to worry about. Hence all the edge cases. And notice the authors have even gone um, to the trouble of, for example, putting in a note here where they explain what they're doing and explain how you could go wrong. Um, and in the past, not to criticize because I can't write any of this code, but um, people have put in incorrect distributions and that's why they are actually often careful to document what they're doing, why they're doing, and sometimes even document the history of how things have gone wrong in the past. Okay. So of course, other distributions are available, such as the triangular distribution. So let's go ahead and plot that. Um, that's an interesting one, the triangular distribution. What does that look like? Other than a triangle, what's sort of the, the interesting feature from a more mathematical standpoint? You can, so you can make it skewed if you want to. Uh, basically, it has one mode, and you can sort of position where you want that mode to be, right? Um, so if we look at the source code for this, we can see uh, the triangular has a low, a high, and a mode that you can set. If you don't set the mode, it's going to be just right in the, in the middle. And this is going to give you a continuous distribution bounded by your given lower and upper limits and having a given mode value in between. OK. Uh, this has some remarkably short code that we can work through. So that's what I'd like us to do right now. So we have um, just what something like eight lines of code. So that's also been pasted below in the next cell. We use u, which is just our random number, right? We grab that self.random. Again, everything is getting built off of self.random at the end of the day. Um, and what else do we have? We have the high and the low and the mode. So here I've set the mode to 0 0.25 precisely because I want to generate a skewed distribution. I don't want a symmetric distribution. And from there, what's going to happen? So u is going to be random. C is going to be 0.5 if the mode is none, else mode minus low divided by high minus low. So what is C giving me? What's this value C? Let's print it out if we're not sure, right? That's the nice thing about being able to code this. What's C? It's 0.25, but what 0.25 is it? This is getting a little confusing in part because my high and my low are just on the range of 0 to 1. So one thing I can do to try to clarify is to maybe make my high 10, right? I can configure this however I like. Uh, so if I do this, what is my C going to be? Well, we've got mode minus low over high minus low. So now it's 0.025, right? Because my 0.025, it's just mode minus the low over high minus the low. So that's sort of like the percentage of the overall range to sort of get to my mode, right? It's sort of the probability of being below my mode versus above my mode just on that uniform range. OK. So if I print that out, and I'll keep printing that, uh, the next question this algorithm asks is, um, is u greater than c? And I'm actually, I'm going to go back to the 1.025 example because that's a little bit easier to digest mathematically. Um, if u is greater than c, what are we going to do? We're actually going to flip the u and flip the c and also flip the low high. So what's going on there? <laughs> 
So for example, in this case where we sampled, u is 0.99, c is 0.25, but then because c was um, less than u, because my desired mode was less than the number I picked, I flipped u to be 1 minus u, and I flipped c to be 1 minus c. And then I also flipped the high and the low. Okay, so if we want to, want to think about why that's happening, let's keep this u. So now I'm actually, instead of the random, I'm going to comment out this random, and I'm going to just put in this u value. So I have this u value so that I'll just always have the same behavior as I go through this. And now I want to think, okay, so now I've gone through this exercise. I'm trying to get some insight into why I would switch the u and the c to be sort of their probabilistic complement. I'm trying to understand why I would switch the low high. So now if I switch the low high, they've just been switched. So high minus low is just negative one instead of one. Um, and then the number I'm ultimately going to be returning is uh, going to be this high minus low, negative one now, uh, plus the high, right? Because low is now the high, one plus negative one times u times c to the point five. So let's also think, what is u times c? Very small number, and u times c raised to the point five, still a fairly small number, multiplied by high minus low is just going to be give me a negative. So this whole thing ends up giving me uh, quite a large number of 0.91. OK, so uh, with my u being equal to 0.99, I get an output of 0.91. 0.91. So we took a u that was a fairly high number in our uniform range, and it took us to a fairly high number. Uh, what should we try next? Well, hmm? OK, so low, and how do we define low? Below the mode also, right? So near 0, but also we want to define it in relation to our mode. So uh, my mode is 0.25. So let it, let's just memorialize this. that. Uh, u of 0.99 led to this outcome of 0.91. So we'll just keep a recording of this. And now, taking matters into our own hands again, we'll do something like u is equal to 0.01, right? So go to the other end of the spectrum. So in this case, what do we expect to see? So we don't do any switching. u is 0.01, c is 0.25. Um, we do not enter this branch, right? That's sort of the division is, do we enter this branch or not? Um, and what do we get as our output is 0.05. In this case, the u times c, 0.0025, and taking the square root of that um, gets us 0.05, which we add to uh, the low, right? So high minus low times this number of 0.05 to the low. So in this case, our 0.01 gets us to 0.05. So one thing you might, you might uh, already be able to think about, right? We're sort of thinking about our inputs as a uniform distribution. If we think about it that way, I think, OK, I pick a really extreme value, like 0.99, and out pops, right? Because I happen to be sampling from the same 0, 1. I just want it to be triangular instead of uniform. Out pops something that has moved to be less extreme. So what we're seeing is this algorithm is effect effectively, compared to our uniform distribution, it's taking some of that probability density and that's getting moved to the other side of the mode. And the way I see this manifested in the algorithm is that a number that's relatively high in my base uniform rate, like 0.99, gets moved. It sort of gets dragged, or like the probability is getting pushed around to 0.91. And then what do we see on the other side? That 0.01, right, in my original uniform distribution is sort of getting like expanded, right? That probability is growing, and that gets moved to 0.05. Um, one other case, what, what about if we just pick pick a u um, that's somehow closer to the mode on either side. So what happens if we do u is 0 0.024? What do we think will happen? Definitely going to stay on that side of the mode. Hmm? 
might get pushed away a little bit, and why would it get pushed away a little bit? Okay, so we have we have a we have a theory as as to what we expect to see. Let's see if we're right, right? This is actually kind of fun. We're like our our code is becoming our experiment. Okay, so if we put u of point two four in, we actually we actually get pushed a little bit towards the mode um, unexpectedly. And the the reason for that is if you think about it here, this term is is sort of like a geometric average of the mode and what we're putting in. Um, so sometimes it can even be a little bit difficult to reason about how these things work, and that's why why it's so great to experiment. Uh, so I hope I haven't belabored the point too much, but I just want to give you this example of you can start to develop intuitions, uh, test hypotheses that may be wrong or right about how it's working, um, and you should just feel very empowered to jump into these code bases because they're quite accessible, uh, and you can just run them beautifully, unlike possibly in the, in the 90s. Okay, uh, so what about a Gaussian normal distribution? What about that one, right? That's another one we all need all of the time. Uh, I'm sure this is almost everyone's bread and butter as far as drawing from these things, but have you ever looked into how they are generated? So if you haven't, you might be interested to see again from the random uh, library, the Gauss implementation in this next version. Uh, go ahead and just take a minute or two to read this on your own. Uh, you really just have to get down to here. And again, like we saw before, uh, it's all built off of that base random number generator, that self.random. But there's an interesting twist here that makes this uh, more efficient than it might be with a suboptimal implementation. So take a look at what's going on here. Okay, so let's take a look at this one together. So um, very helpfully, they have notes here illustrating this. Uh, this is a very widely deployed algorithm for calculating from the normal distribution or sampling from the normal distribution. Um, when x and y are two variables from the 0, 1 distribution, uniformly distributed, then you can actually produce two random numbers from 1 by taking both the cosine and the sine of 2 pi x and then multiplying it by a common factor. So what does that mean? That means you can get two numbers from a series of operations where you only perform the log and the square root once. You only have to generate the baseline random number once, and then the only thing you need to do two of is the sine versus the cosine operation. So as I mentioned, these things can be quite computationally taxing, so when you can get this sort of reward, you want to use it. We see this being used below, and this is sort of an example, right, because sometimes when you look at this library, you think, well, this is so mathematical, it's not really sort of objecty. Why is this even object-oriented programming? But here's an example, right? Because you can generate two at a time, you can make use of your class variables to hold on to the second one until you need it, right? Because when your function is called, it's usually only asking for the one at a time. So in this case, we, get, we grab our random number generator. Uh, we have z is self.gauss next, right? So if there's a z left over that's not none, you can just go ahead and return that. But if there isn't, then you enter this if branch, if z is none, x2 pi is your random times 2 pi, so you only have to get that random number once, pay the cost once. You only pay the cost of the multiplication once. You only pay the cost of this square root log operation once. 
And then you can get your two numbers, your z, which you'll return now, and then you also save yourself that gauss next for the next time around. So there's, there's sort of some little optimizations that are around that you can probably learn from. I've certainly uh, learned to make my own programming at least a little more mindful sometimes looking at things like this. And I'd also note, um, even in something like drawing from a Gaussian distribution, you notice there's a note saying that this isn't actually a corrected version. So again, this is an area, it's just very tricky, um, easy to have either the wrong intuition or the wrong formula for one way or another. So it's kind of interesting even sociologically to, to look at how people deal with that. Okay, and then finally, I just wanted to show you all the gamma distribution and the base code for that. Uh, we are definitely not going to go through this one in detail. In fact, the point of this one is to say, okay, well, I've shown you things like the triangular distribution and the Gaussian distribution where uh, the way these are generated from a uniformly sampled random number is surprisingly simple. Uh, but I don't want to be deceptive and pretend that that's always the case, right? So as you get into more complicated distributions, it can get quite a bit more um, computationally taxing and also just code taxing uh, to take a look at these and decide uh, how, you, how you will generate these. Um, I would also note that these, this one also had a, a mistake and, and has quite a long history of, of Python bug reports, so that's something you can check out in your spare time if that's interesting to you. Okay, so that's sort of like very baseline, where do these random numbers come from and where did some of these base uh, distributions come from? So next we're gonna uh, jump to something that's a little more prepackaged. We're gonna be looking at simulating distributions from sklearn options, so that's 2A, notebook 2A. Okay. So this also, I would really encourage you to uh, get familiar with the source code, so I have included that as well in the notebook. Um, and you'll notice there's a student and instructor version, so the student notebooks are marked as student. Those are just so that the exercise uh, code is not in there, so I'd encourage you to use those, but it's, it's your decision at the end of the day. Okay, so we're gonna generate data sets for clustering and classification. Uh, we start with just saying how many samples we want, how many bins we want, and some centers, and we are going to use the sklearn make blobs option. So from sklearn datasets, import make blobs. In fact, in the sklearn datasets API, there's a whole component that allows you to uh, generate from distributions that can be useful for testing out machine learning algorithms, and one of them is the make blobs. So what do I get out of this? Notice I've set... Uh, Shuffling to false, random state, I set the centers, the number of samples, the number of features, the cluster standard deviation. Um, I get X shape has 5,000 samples, each with two features. That's because that's the number of samples and features I asked for. Y shape is the same. If I take a look at the Ys, they seem to be a bunch of zeros. Um, and if I wanted to do a bin count on those Ys, I see that they seem to be uniformly or evenly distributed among the four, and they're sort of perfectly distributed. What does this look like? What did I get from my make blobs? I got a bunch of blobs. Um, the centers are where I wanted them to be. The distributions are where I wanted them to be. Um, and this was much faster than, say, if I had to code this up myself as some kind of for loop generating two-dimensional data, right? So it's nicely packaged. Um, I can also, for example, adjust easily the weighting of the number of samples by just passing it an array with the number of samples. So if I do that, I will now have sort of differently sized clusters, right? So again, much easier. Sure, I could code this up myself, but it certainly would be a big pain in the butt compared to a one-liner from sklearn. Okay, so first exercise, just go ahead and try out this code, um, adjusting the standard deviation. So try to have clusters that have different standard deviations. Think of what this could look like. So take a minute or two for that. <laughs> 
Okay, so if you went to the distribution and you looked at the set of parameters, you would see that, for example, the cluster devi standard deviation, um, just like things like the centers, can be a float or a sequence of floats, right? So if it's a sequence of floats, then it just needs to match up. And I can do a scatter plot. And for example, I could have uh, very loosely spread out clusters versus really tight clusters and um, have that available for analysis. Let's look at these other options, right? So number of samples, right? That gives me an opportunity to work with small data sets or large data sets as I want. Um, number of features gets me the opportunity to adjust the, the dimensionality, um, where the centers go, how much I want them to overlap. There's also this shuffle option. Why would I need that? I mean, it's just a matter of whether it would be convenient to have your data ordered or not, right? So generally, if you want to be feeding it in for training, you probably don't want it ordered. Uh, that is not really what your inputs would be assuming in most cases, so that's not what you would want. Uh, but for ease of bookkeeping or whatever, it's good to know those options are available, right? And just as a reminder with SKLearn, generally anything you can think of that would be remotely useful that you're thinking, oh, that would be a pain to do myself, is just there for you in the API. Okay, so now let's take a look at this make blob source code, which I also had better comment out before I override it. Uh, so this, these are all available in the sklearn dataset samples generator code. So if we look here, make blobs, there it is, make blobs, so we can, we can see uh, the doc strings, et cetera. I'm gonna go back to the notebook to look at this, but we have our end samples and, and features and so on, uh, use cases, and eventually we get down to the actual code. Uh, so most of this code too, it's not especially complicated, most of this code is sort of error checking or figuring out did you give it a float, an integer, or some kind of array, right, because depending on how you did it, it just needs to reconfigure a little bit. Um, and then we finally get down to making the actual clusters, and what do we see that it's doing in this case? How is it making those clusters? It's actually right here, right? So it, it's just drawing from um, the underlying normal distribution to generate these clusters just in a list, just what you might do yourself, except now it's nicely packaged, right? So to sort of think about where we've gone, we started at the basics of how would you even get a random number, then we looked at, okay, if you can get a random number in the uniform distribution, how does that get you to other distributions like a weird triangle or the Gaussian distribution and so on, and now we're here we are generating blobs with one-liners, but it's all sort of built on the same machinery. So just Thinking about it, we could actually write this code all the way from the level of accessing the random bits made available by our OS all the way to these beautifully colored plots all on our own. We actually wouldn't need sklearn to do any of this for us because we've just seen all of the steps involved. Um, and wonderfully, at least for a, the normal distribution, it turns out to be fairly accessible and not that difficult. So that's just something that's handy to remember. Um, I think our you know, the people who did our jobs, you know, 20 or 40 years ago, I'm sure actually just routinely did that and it was old hat. And it's actually, uh, you know, not so inaccessible or difficult to do. Okay, so now let's look at a, a variation of this, make classification from sklearn, it's the same idea. So we're gonna make classification data, right? You are learning some new algorithm and you wanna figure out how to classify it. Or there are other reasons you might wanna do this, right? Maybe you're working with some particularly difficult data set and you're not having much success and you might have theories about the reasons that you're not having success, but it can be difficult to sort of mathematically prove, oh, my, my XGBoost is not working because this sort of weird feature distribution on this particular class is just weird and I can't even do it myself, so how could my tree do it? So, uh, that gives you an opportunity to test that theory, right? You can try to make a data set that looks like maybe the problems that you are identifying. So let's go ahead and uh, first look at the sklearn make classification API description. And if we do that, what do we see? So we have n samples, n features. Okay, that's just like the make blobs. But now we're really getting into something um, that could potentially help us with these problematic data sets because the next few parameters you'll see are number informative, number redundant, and number repeated. So you have sort of three categories. Um, number informative is not going to be your number of features, right? This presupposes that you actually wanna have fewer informative features than total number of features, right? Which is a very common uh, attribute of a machine learning 
data set, especially if it hasn't been particularly well prepared or you don't know much about it yet. Um, likewise with redundant, right, what is this giving us? This is giving us those correlated inputs that can be a pain in the butt, right, when you realize, oh, I'm just measuring the same thing three different ways or approximately the same thing 15 different ways. Uh, so you have your redundant um, and also repeated. So does anyone ever run into that where you might actually just have repeated inputs? You definitely get that. Survey data, you know, how old are you? When were you born? Oh, wait, that's sort of the same data, right? And you might even transform it and realize it's, it's even numerically the same, right? So this is also something you will actually run into. Uh, so if we make classifications, and in this case, I'm making uh, four features, zero redundant, two informative. Um, I'm also just doing one cluster per class. So this also offers you the opportunity to have sort of classes that themselves have some complexity within their structure. Uh, so if we look at this, it gives us sort of an evenly spaced bin count. And now I can look at different features to see the divisions, right? So I've got two classes here. I've got my points colored by class. In this case, I am plotting the first and the second feature against one another. This looks really quite informative, doesn't it? Uh, the reason for that is that the order they come back in is actually in the order of first the informative then the redundant slash repeat, and then the useless, um, which is very nice of them that you don't have to figure it out, right? They give it to you because the whole point is you're using these synthetic data sets to make your life easy and to test things. You don't want it to just become a new uh, opaque data set where you're not quite sure what's going on. So that's our scatter plot. Um, so presumably X, X2, right, this third column of my X, this is actually not going to be very useful. So what does that then look like? So this is my useful axis, the x-axis, and this is my useless axis, my y-axis. Um, and what do I see? I see going along the useful axis, obviously I get a useful division, whereas not so much going along my useless axis, right? That if I, if I just look along that axis, there's no information telling me what class something would belong to. Um, and then likewise for um, if I'm plotting my other sort of useful feature against my useless axis, now I, I can't even see this useful feature that it's useful, right? Because this one was actually built in tandem with the first feature, right? It, it's sort of projected off of it. Uh, so that's also interesting to keep in mind. The more sort of informative features you have, uh, the more important it is to plot them against one another because they are projections into that space. Okay. So let's take a look at the source code here. So make classification. Start with this. Skip over the, uh, the first function as you read, and we'll come back to that. But make classification. A uh, bunch of inputs, bunch of doc strings. Uh, here we go. We're just doing some error checking, right? For example, if the number of features you're, re you're requesting in some way is not consistent, we're going to error out there. Um, otherwise, we're also going to set the number of useless and the number of clusters. We're going to do some weighting if weights have been provided, say if I don't want evenly uh, sampled classes distribute the classes among my weights. And then here's where I'm actually doing the, the real work of generating these classes. So take a minute to read this code on your own, and then we will talk about this. <laughs> 
Okay, so let's look at this together. What do we see? So we see first, as is good practice, we pre-allocate our X's and our Y's, right? We don't want to fill those in as we go. Uh, then we have this interesting code, centroids equals generate hypercube. So we're going to pop up and look at that in a second, but let's not lose our train of thought right now. So we have these centroids where we're going to be sort of centering our various classes. And notice this is by the number of clusters, not by the number of classes. And the reason for that is, as I mentioned, they offer the opportunity in your classes to have more of a complex structure and not just one cluster. Uh, so they are accounting for that. So we have our centroids. OK, that, that begins to look a little bit like make blob, where we just had centers where we were going to put our blobs. Uh, it looks like we've, the way we've done it is a little more complicated with make centroids. But other than that, now we've just got some points. And we want to center our classes, or our clusters, rather, around those points. OK, so then for each centroid in the centroids, it's just going to grab a start stop, fill this in, um, and generate a random matrix. And with this XK, do the random matrix, right? So basically what you do is you generate a bunch of random numbers. And you want to have some sort of uh, correlation between those numbers, right? You want some sort of non-identity uh, covariance matrix, for example, so that you have some sort of shape to your clusters, which is what makes the classification problem more interesting. So you introduce that by dotting your A with your X, which is otherwise just a set of random numbers. And so you've got a chunk of your X all correlated together, centered around one centroid. And you do that for all your centroids. So that is how you're generating each cluster. And then remember, a cluster is not necessarily the same as the class. So then you also have your class label, which is what we see further on. So that's the meat of it, where you're generating the informative features, right? The ones that are correlated in a meaningful way. And now we have to add the useless features, right? So if we continue, we have redundant features. What are redundant features? They're just using the, the same feature space again. What are repeated features? Same thing, right? In this case, um, just repeating your values, taking some random numbers to decide which of your uh, meaningful inputs you're going to reuse, and then reusing those. And then for your useless, you're really just filling those in with a random number generator. So as far as um, generating correlated values, if you haven't worked through this before, so this is dotting with your covariance matrix or your correlation matrix. This is how this works, so just to give you a proof of concept, right? So I can just generate random values, right, just with np.random.normal, but I want them to be correlated, so I really just create this uh, correlation matrix, which is 1 plus whatever value I want them correlated between my two numbers. So in this case, I said minus 0.5, and there we go. But this can be anything. It can be 0, and then I'm going to get a nice blob. It can be 0 0.9. And then I'm going to get something really nicely correlated. It can even be 1. And then I just have my straight line. So that's uh, sort of the extent of the numerical tricks that are used there. Now let's go up now and see the uh, generate hypercube. So if we go back to the top of the source code cell, def generate hypercube. So what does it have in this case? What does it want? It tells us, or it needs, the number of samples, the dimensions, and the range. So if dimensions is greater than 30, uh, which I don't think we'll run into that case, it's just going to h stack some random ints. In this case, it can just um, use a numerical trick to give it what it wants, because you're almost sort of maxing out on your bit options in this case. But what we're going to look at is the case of a reasonable number of dimensions. So in this case, sample without replacement, 2 to the power of dimensions. How many samples do we want? Samples set a random range, and as dtype u4. Now, the reason it's doing this is we're actually going to generate a set of numbers uh, with a certain bit count. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to unpack the bit count. And in unpacking the bit count, what are we doing? Thinking of, think about it, right? The dimensionality, right, to generate our hypercube, we have the two options for each dimension, right? We either want it the positive or the negative, the 0 or the 1 along each dimension. So we unpack the bit so that each bit in the random number we generated, now we look at the bits within that random number. And each of those is going to give us the coordinates for our hypercube, right? So along each bit, is it 0 or 1? So that's an interesting case of using a little bit of bit arithmetic to do something that's related to data analysis by generating our hypercubes. Uh, so I'd encourage you to wor work through that on your own as well. It's really interesting to just sort of run the code 
um, and see where your hypercubes are. So uh, we will do that when we come back from a quick break. So let's go ahead and take five minutes to get coffee or whatever, and then we'll work through this. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first thing I want to mention, somebody pointed out to me during the break uh, that it could be interesting to try this dot product uh, trick as far as generating correlated variables uh, with a non-normal distribution. So we went ahead and did that. Uh, here we go. Uh, so we looked at uh, generating uniformly distributed random variables and finding a way to make them correlated. And it turns out that if you use this, you get you know sort of something like you would expect. It's a little bit more box-like because, of course, you can't just fabricate a normal distribution out of a non-normal underlying distribution, but you can also generate uh, correlated variables, right? So you can do this with any underlying distribution, although the shape of what that will look like will vary uh, depending on your base case. So it can be handy for other, uh, other situations in life, not just generating normal distributions with a matrix. Okay. Uh, so I said I had wanted to revisit also this uh, generate hypercube component of make classification. I think this is just interesting for us data analysts to learn a little bit about how uh, folks who do uh, more computery stuff think about things and how they compute things, because that's you know definitely not my job most of the time. Uh, but they write this sort of beautiful code that's pretty easy to understand, and we can reap the benefits. So in this case, I uh, just want to show you I put in a few... Uh, PDB traces so we can sort of pause, right? Because instead of trying to read this code and figure out what it's actually going to do, I'm just going to work through it and, and try to understand it that way. Yeah. So I've also pasted the code below here so we can also see it while we're running our PDB. So we just run the make classification, which calls this make hypercubes inside. Uh, so firstly, I just want to see, like, what do I have in there? Samples. I, so I'm asking for two samples. Dimensions. What's that? for two dimensions, right? That was the sort of data I was looking to generate was two informative dimensions. And what's this RNG thing? Oh, that's the random state. That's my random number generator or really my pseudo random number generator if we want to be snobby about it. Um, okay, so I have just broken at the beginning because I want to see what is going to happen with this even before it happens. So if I do this, what am I seeing? What do I get back from this really complicated sample without replacement two to the dimension samples random state as type D type copy equals false? What's going on here? That why is this so complicated that I only get back a three and a two? Uh, okay, well two to the dimensions. What's that giving me? That's the four, right? So I want a sample out of zero, one, two, three, and I get three and two from that. And what is this as type D type U four? What's this doing? Let's look this up. Ah, it's a data type, right? It's one way of representing an integer. So that's one integer. I believe it's an 8-bit integer, if I recall correctly. Um, so if I progress to the next line, let's see. What was it called? Yes, out. Okay, so if we look at out, okay, it's a uint32. I can also just run my code and find out exactly what it is using 32 bits, and it's got a 1 and a 2. Okay, so now let's continue. What do we do next? So we basically, we just got an array with a particular kind of integer representation uh, sampled such that the integers we're getting in that integer representation uh, correspond to the numbers up to, but not including the number of dimensions. So 0, 2, number of dimensions minus 1, 2 to that power, okay? Uh, so 2 to the power, why? Because you're having a hypercube, right? So along each dimension, you're going to have the two points on that dimension. Okay. So if I go to that, my next bit of code, out equals np.unpack bits, out.view u1, reshape, what is going on here? What do I get out of this? Wow, so actually, actually what has magically happened is that what I had as a 1 and a 2 has now become a 0, 1, 1, 0. And these can be um, locations, right? So 0 along one dimension, 1 along the other, 1 along one dimension, 0 along the other. Um, 
thinking about the little tiny bit of, you know, sort of bit representation I know, I'm thinking, oh, well, how do I represent a one in binary? Well, that would just be a one in the rightmost digit, right? Because one is one in, in any sort of base number counting. And what is two if I'm counting in base two? Well, that would be a one and a zero. So what this has cleverly done is used integer representation as a way to generate hypercube location. So it said, okay, let's take random integers. And how do we get our random integers? By sampling from our baseline uniform, right? So this goes back to what we started with. We started with how do we get just some number in the U zero to one uniform representation. We then already went through the wrapper of converting that to some integer from zero up to two to the uh, number of dimensions minus one. So we then sampled an integer, but we're not done with our random sampling yet. We are now using that integer, converting it, looking at its bitwise representation and using that to get random vertices of a hypercube, right? So we've sort of gone through three layers. Why do we do this? This is a way of randomly assigning where those clusters should be, right? With make blob, we had to sort of decide. When I decide, it's a little bit like, let me try to introspect about random numbers. I'm going to come up with 7 and 17 and stuff that really seems random, but that might not actually be very random, right? So the more we can take out of our own control and truly randomize, the better. Um, and this offers a principled way of doing that, right? We want to have random vertices chosen, al chosen along the hypercube. Um, could you do this other ways? Sure, you could write out and enumerate for any number of dimensions. You could have some algorithm that generates all the possible uh, hypercube vertices, right? And then sample from those. Why is this better than that? I think that would be more readable, at least for someone like me who's more of a data analyst, right? I can understand a for loop and generating the hypercubes, whereas this I sort of have to Google and try it out and see how it's working. Um, but why is this actually better? Well, for two reasons, right? Um, one, it's more efficient, right? Um, I have, I'd have to sort of allocate them all, and if I have a lot of dimensions, you can imagine I would sort of blow this thing up, right? And two, I'm actually like doing less generation of random numbers, right? I've just generated the random numbers I need for the hypercube. I don't need to sort of generate my whole list of potential hypercube vertices and then generate a set of indices and then index off of that, right? That ends up being more computationally taxing as well. So sometimes I get upset and I'm like, why do these CS people have to do this like bitwise this and that? It's really annoying. I don't even understand it. I have to like PDB and, and all sorts of crap. But actually, it's really elegant, and it's much more efficient, and it's truly random, right? This is a clever way of saying, oh, I'm going to generate sort of a random integer in the human representation, and then I'm going to look at it in the bitwise representation and get a geometrically random set of points. So that's really cool, in my opinion. OK, so uh, that is it for looking at sklearn options. There are actually, I just want to call your attention to sklearn data sets, because there are even more. If you look at the API reference, right, you, uh, I, I know in the past I was mostly on the data sets. Like, what can I get for free without having to go find my own? But where are these? Here we go. There's actually this whole um, ecosystem of samples generators. Uh, so make by cluster. I mean, I actually, from reading this, I even learned about methods of analysis I didn't even know about, such as by clustering. Maybe I should be embarrassed. I didn't know that was a thing, especially uh, in earlier decades before we just could do regular clustering, which is easier and easier to understand. Um, you can make sparse matrices. You can make sparse symmetric positive definite matrices. That sounds really esoteric, but what is that? Among many things, that's how you're going to do your PCA and have random components. That's how you can have covariance and correlation matrices, right? So this stuff sounds really mathy or theoretical, but this is exactly the sort of thing you need to generate most of what is interesting to you, some sort of correlated data or data with some series of baseline components and so on. So I would really encourage you to uh, take more of a look at this on your own. I think uh, many of us are sort of aware of the sort of fancier ones like, uh, like the, this sort of demonstration, right, where uh, there are these like, like fancy moon-like things, concentric circles. Um, these are actually not going to be quite as useful to you in real life, right? Because your data is not usually going to look like that. Those are sort of cool for nifty demos. But what is going to be useful to you is uh, this ability, for example, to generate these semi-positive definite matrices, right? That is, that is something actually in your life. So instead of going for sort of the flashy whiz-bang ones, I would encourage you to read the sort of more boring ones and, and think about how those actually apply in your research. Okay, so um, just staying on the topic of looking at distributions and um, sort of more statistical models, I just want to talk very briefly about simulating from a model. 
Okay, so when we want to sample from a model, maybe we have like a broader model of how we think the world works, right? So, so far we've done things like uniform distribution, multivariate, uh, correlated multivariate, you know, high, highly correlated, less correlated, and so on. Um, but we might also have other ways of how the, the world works, right? We might have, uh, for example, in Bayesian statistics, uh, you might say, well, I have this prior, I think, I think that the way people do X is distributed this way, right? I think people swim at about this rate, and I'm going to put some sort of prior on it, and then I'm going to look at the empirical distribution and, and have a way of updating that, right? So there's a whole field of Bayesian statistics, which is quite related to this idea of simulation, uh, and there are well-developed techniques for thinking about that. There are also, though, other sorts of models that are more complex than just a normal distribution. So the two models I'm going to talk about uh, fairly briefly, though, are um, sort of a traditional ARMA model, which is where you describe a time series in terms of its past values and past errors, and also another uh, traditional time series model called a hidden Markov model, where you think about time series data as being some sort of function of underlying state. So we're going to take a look at what it means to simulate those. Um, so just more generally, I want to call your attention to the fact that sampling from complex distributions, as many of you are probably aware, is a very complicated active area of research, active area of uh, software development. There are many talks going on in the next few days here in particular about uh, using these tools, so that's good to be aware of. Um, and there are many ways of, of sampling these things. So you can, you can read up on that. I want to talk in particular about these two models I mentioned. Uh, time series models. The first one is the hidden Markov model. So this is the model of our data where we now introduce a temporal component, right? So before this, we were sort of looking at cross-sectional data, right? I just want different random draws from baseline populations. Now I want to go a step further and say, well, I want different sample draws from a baseline population uh, in population in the sense of distribution that is evolving over time, right? So in addition to having like a snapshot at one moment in time, I also have this idea of how the snapshot evolves over time, right? So now we're adding another layer. What we've been doing is drawing from populations. Now I want to see how populations evolve over time. And we're also briefly going to look at a time series model, autoregressive moving average. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this, and I'm not trying to shove time series down everyone's uh, gullets or whatever, but um, in this case, you think of data, right? You think of you're measuring some sort of process over time, and you want to think about what does that look like one way to model it is you say, OK, this process, x sub t, is a function of its past values, which are delineated by this uh, expression over here, 1 minus alpha times the lag operator. So in this case, we're just saying we're going to take x sub t. We're going to move it back in time. So I'll have x sub t minus 1, x sub t minus 2, and so on, and multiply it by a variety of alpha values, uh, one coefficient per lag. And then on the other side, I'm also going to say this is somehow equal to uh, a series of lagged error coefficients. So very basically, this is saying, OK, I want to think about a system where sort of past values in my process predict future values some, to some extent. So how do we think about simulating these? Well, now we're going to go to another notebook. So let's go to notebook 2B. So the first thing I want to show you is just that these are um, highly available uh, to you. So when you're thinking about a situation like this, there's no need to reinvent the wheel or think, oh my goodness, how would I code this anyway? Or I have so many dependencies, et cetera. So the first exercise is uh, very unfairly, all I've done is sort of tell you what an ARMA model is. And now I'm saying, go ahead and simulate it. Like, don't even learn about the statistical properties. Let's really take the out-of-the-box solution. Uh, so go ahead and simulate from an ARMA model. And the hint is to go look at the statsmodels.api.tsa. And you can, you can even sort of see the answer here, but I would encourage you to go read the API very briefly uh, to go take a look at ARMA generate sample and think about how you might deploy that. So take one or two minutes, and then we'll talk about that. OK, folks, so I'm um, hearing that some people don't have HMM Learn, which is uh, quite understandable. And I apologize, I hadn't put that in the requirements. This was a last minute addition. Um, you can pip install HMM Learn if you have pip available. I'm seeing for people with Windows and Aconda installation that it doesn't seem to find HMM Learn. It's also a very small package, so you can also di download it directly from Git and just drop it in your directory to make sure it's in your import path. 
I see. Uh, at least for one person, it said package not found uh, in Windows. I've always I've used Conda and Pip alike on Linux, but I don't have experience with Windows, for example. So. Ah, okay, and Mac worked. We're so lucky to have so many ecosystems. It's fantastic. Okay, in any case, this is a short module, so it's not super important if you don't have it. This is more I wanted to show you some options, so I don't want you to get too stressed out. And again, I apologize for not mentioning that earlier. Okay, so let's talk about the ARMA model, right? Um, to me, the point is, is I expect a lot of people in this room have not been exposed to this sort of model, so it's a great example of as long as you can sort of dig up a way to simulate it, you can already start getting insights, right? Because sometimes uh, someone will throw like a really complicated equation at you like I just did, or at least I find that to be a really complicated equation with lag operators, and say, oh, it's so simple, and like, let's just move on and start analyzing this, and I'm, I'm just sort of like this. But luckily, nowadays, we have so many options to simulate these sort of well-known traditional models that we can just play around with it, right? So in this particular case, um, we just had to set some parameters. You also have to add this one, that's sort of the self parameter, the zero lag. Um, so that's the unfortunate little bit of thinking I think you'd have to do even if you haven't been exposed to ARMA before. And, and then you just sample. And so the delightful thing here, just like we saw with earlier examples, right? For example, I don't really understand how the triangular distribution is generated from our uniform, but I can begin to understand it and think about it by just sticking numbers in. So we're gonna do the same thing here, right? So here is one ARMA. This is some kind of two, two. So I have two autoregressive coefficients. I have two uh, moving average coefficients. And then I think, okay, well, that's one version, but what about if I just make this a zero and a zero? What does that look like? Oh, that, seem, that seems to get smoother or it somehow has fewer kinks. And what if I make this negative instead of positive? Oh, then it gets a lot jumpier. And is that, is that sort of replicable? What, is that a positive or a negative? Ah, it's less jumpy. And if I put the negative back in, no, oh, it's more jumpy again, right? So I, I can start getting insights. Oh, like this coefficient seems to have some kind of impact. So let me take away that jumpiness. Actually, let me just drop this here. What about on the other hand, if I put a negative here into the moving average, what does that do? Oh, that also makes it jumpier, right? So these negative things seem to make it jumpier. If you think about it, right, then if you go back to the model and think about it, I think even if you haven't seen this before, this can make a little sense, right? This is, x, this is x at t minus 1. How does it influence x, right? If this number is positive, that suggests that x sub t as a function of x sub t minus 1, that these things are sort of correlated, right? Like if one was big, the other one will sort of be big. Or if one was small, the other one will sort of be small to the extent that it's contributing. On the other hand, if it's negative, right, that's almost like forcing that negative correlation, right? If I say negative, if I say x sub t is a function of x sub t minus 1 times negative 0.55, that means when one value was really big and positive, the other value is going to swing really big and negative. And so that's what we see there. And so even without necessarily knowing much about this model, I can already get a sense of underlying behaviors. And that will really help me when I start to study the theory of these models. So this is a good case of when you have a complicated model, if there's some out of the box way to just simulate it before you even get into the nitty gritty, I actually find that really helpful as a way to get the insights. Okay, so now we're going to simulate a hidden Markov model from HMM Learn. Um, for anyone having difficulty, we're just doing one example, so don't worry about it too much if you're not able to get this on your computer. Although, as I mentioned, it's, it's really a tiny module, and it's on GitHub, so you can also just download it and grab the source. Okay, so let's go back to the slide for a second uh, to think about hidden Markov models. This is the model here that we're going to be uh, simulating. So what are the key components of this? I guess I'll blow it up again. What does it mean that something is a Markov model? What a Markov model means is that what's going to happen at time t plus 1 only depends if I know it on what's happening at t. That is, as long as I know what's happening now, I don't need to know anything about the past to predict the future. Now, I say that and you say, sure, and nod your head and think it's simple, but this is fundamentally different from the ARMA model we just looked at, right? The ARMA model says, I'm going to model a process as sort of like this sum of many, many things that happened in the past. It's sort of like a moving average. And I think the ARMA model is probably a better descriptor, for example, of how humans think, right? For example, when, you, when I ask you, well, how do you feel about your spouse today? You'll be like, 
well, my spouse made me coffee this morning and that was nice, but yesterday they didn't take out the garbage when they were supposed to and the day before um, they got to sleep late and I had to go go to work early and they weren't very sympathetic. And so like the, the way I'm feeling about my spouse is sort of like some kind of sum of that thing, right? Versus uh, a hidden Markov model, which is very not human at all, would be like, how are you feeling about your spouse? And you would just sort of like look at them at that exact moment and decide. And I'd be like, I'm feeling great because my spouse has this like fantastic suit on right now and is looking so handsome or whatever and, and nothing in the past matters. Um, so that's the hidden Markov model. Now this actually turns out to be a great physical description though for all sorts of things that are not like human relationships, right? Things where it's not that it's a memory free process because where you are happen based on what happened in the past. So it's not that the past is irrelevant, it's just that any information you know is summed up in what's going on now. So this is a fundamentally different way to think about data, and this can also be simulated fairly easily and out of the box. So to my mind, that's the really cool part, is you have actually a fairly complex model and there's just out of the box simulations, which I have to say, for example, when I was working on these in college was not true and they were a pain in the butt. Uh, so it's quite nice that they're around now. So, what are the things we need to know for this model? Ah, I left out an important point. The final bit about a hidden Markov model is that there are two things going on. You have the hidden things that you can't really see, and then you have the manifestation. So that's the final bit of complexity about this model. We hypothesize that what's happening in the world, which is what we can see, the whys, is a function of things that we can't see, but that have some sort of underlying truth to them, right? Um, and so to go back, for example, to uh, the spouse example, right? You can't see into your spouse's brain, like, do you still love me today? Or, or are you going to like take out the garbage like you promised me? You can't see this true underlying state. You only get to see the manifestation of that state, right? So you get to see, did they get you coffee this morning? Or did they take out the garbage like they promised you? And actually, this part is sort of well described by human relations, right? Because um, let's say you observe that your spouse did not take out the garbage that tends to suggest that the underlying state was that they intended not to, but it doesn't actually prove it, right? It's probabilistic. There is some chance that their underlying state was that they fully intended to keep their promise and then they just forgot. But it's also possible the underlying state is that they never intended to keep their promise and didn't do it, right? And so uh, we actually, in this sense, use this sort of rationale all, our, all the time in our own thinking, even about simple things, like human, well, simple things like human relationships, to the extent that we realize that the manifestations we see are some probabilistic indicator of the underlying rate. Also true um, in more sort of natural science applications. For example, hidden Markov models are often used to describe the state of DNA. For example, maybe you're observing uh, something about how the proteins are manufactured, but the baseline state is actually the methylation of that underlying DNA, which is not directly observable, possibly. So there's an, a natural science example instead of more rom-com stuff. Okay, so now that we've got all that, we need three things to simulate one of these, right? We need the start probability. We need to say, okay, given however many states we've decided we're going to have, what's the probability when I start looking at this process that the state is in each of these, right? So these need to add up to one and be distributed among the states. For example, if I were to fill in a zero here, that wouldn't particularly make sense, right? We also need a transition matrix. The transition matrix is going to describe the probability of going from one state to another state, right? So what's the probability of, um, if I'm looking at sort of, if I'm traversing a bit of DNA, what's the probability of going from, say, that methylated state to the unmethylated state, or from the unmethylated state to the methylated state? And one important thing to realize is that unlike, for example, uh, normal distributions where we expect covariance matrices that are, um, what's the word, symmetric, uh, that doesn't have to be true for transition probabilities. It can be true that the probability of going from a methylated state to an unmethylated state is not the same as the other way around, right? And in fact, that's often what's interesting about science is that there's some directionality, and that's how we get to interesting things like equilibrium states, which I think sort of exist in every natural system no matter how you approach it. So we need that. And then finally, we need um, this distribution, the mu's and the sigmas, which explain the distribution of the y's, right? So given an underlying state, whichever underlying state we're in, what do we expect our observations to look like based on being in that underlying state? So this is where we also acknowledge the stochastic nature, right? There's some underlying state, there's some manifestation of that state, but those might overlap, right? I might see observed data that could be explained by more than one state. And in fact, that's usually when you're gonna need a hidden Markov model. 
Because if you could just look at the whys and back out the underlying state, why would you need a model, right? That's sort of a non-problem problem. I don't, you know, we wouldn't have jobs if those were the problems that we had. Okay. So those are sort of all the things we need to set up. Now, if you were to come back and say, well, I'm not sure this is the best way to learn about hidden Markov models by having to set up one, two, three, four, four variables, all of which have constraints that I need to understand, and is this really helping me? Well, I would say, yeah, I get it. You know, this is a complicated model. Uh, there's a lot to set up, but I think it would still be much worse if we didn't go through this exercise and just started sort of lecturing about um, hidden Markov models and really had no idea what was going on. So at least, A, we've gone through the exercise of having to determine what the parameters are, what their shapes are. That already sort of forces us to understand what they mean. And now, B, we can set this up so we create a hidden Markov model, a Gaussian in particular, uh, because it's going to produce Gaussian observables. And we're going to just assign these variables, and then we're going to go ahead and sample. And the cool thing now is, A, we can uh, check what our plot looks like. So here, um, notice we've actually kind of done a make blobs all over again, right? But not with sklearn. Now we've done a make blobs. But the difference as compared to make blobs sklearn is that our data has quite a bit more structure and depth to it, right? So this, this is one way of visualizing it, but this way of visualizing it is not showing the temporal behavior at all. So let's go ahead and, for example, plot just x sub 1. So if we do that, if we plot x sub 1, now we're seeing this interesting temporal behavior, right? So on the one hand, we can think of our data statically if we were to just uh, grab points and think about where they are. But we can also see, like, well, how is it behaving over time? And now we see a very different kind of behavior. Uh, so this is sort of what we would observe, right? Did the spouse take out the garbage or not? Or, like, is that enzyme produced or not? That is what the x's are, right? So that's, that's provided to us by the simulation. But we can also say, well, what was the underlying base state that produced that? And that's what's in this plot. Um, Please realize sort of the numerical values here don't mean anything. All that matters is sort of the level. Like something that's on a different level is a different underlying state. Like this state is different from this state, but the numbers themselves don't mean anything. But what I can see is my system is sort of bouncing around from one state to another and back and then here and, and bouncing around quite a bit. So I can see three different ways of looking at this simulated data, right? I could take that standard cross-sectional view that I've already had. I can sort of take a univariate time series of um, some observable, or I can now look at the underlying state. Okay, so let's also, in this case, take a, a detour to the underlying code. If we go to hmmlearn slash base.py, and then we need to look for a, a function called sample. So this is actually the one we just called on our object. Let's see, maybe if I do def sample. There we go. Uh, so what do we need here? Again, we're making use of the object-oriented nature. We've got the number of samples and the random state. So what, is it, what does it do here? Okay, well, check if it's fitted. Check some random state stuff. Um, okay, here we go. Here's something interesting, right? The start probability CDF is a cum sum of that start probability that we provided, right? That's the probability of starting in any given state. It also takes the transmatrix CDF, right? So the cumulative sum along that transmatrix on each of the column axes. It gets the current state. And from that current state, it's going to generate its next random state, right? So it says, okay, you're in a particular current state, but now I'm going to apply that transition matrix, right, to determine how you should transition out of that current state to your next state. And that fits the states, right? So this gives us our states. And then if we go here, so we get our underlying states in our base class. And then in our hmm.py, generate this one. Let's see. Generate some. So in this case, we have generate sample from state, right? So now we've, in the first step, we've generated the states, right? We took our priors for where we start. We looked at our transition matrix. We did that repeatedly to create the states, right? Because that's the ground truth. Now we back out and say, okay, now that we have the states, we're going to use those states to sample what we would actually see. So now it goes through all of the states. And for each state, it generates a multivariate normal. Why a multivariate normal? Because this is a Gaussian hidden Markov model. If I used a different kind of hidden Markov model, I would have a different distribution. But here it's recognizing, okay, so for each time step in your state, generate the points that correlate to that state. 
Um, so there's nothing sort of surprising. There's no computational tricks here. I think that's what we all would have done once we sort of understand the model sufficiently well. But this is one way of learning it rather than having to deduce it, is to read the source code. OK, so that's um, time series models, just because that is near and dear to my heart, and also because I always think it's really cool to point out that something like this that could just look like a standard blob could actually have quite a bit of underlying structure behind it, right? And that doesn't have to be just a temporal axis. It can also be some other dimension that maybe you're ignoring. Um, and another reason when you're sort of thinking about uh, simulating data to maybe explore a little more widely than you originally considered. OK, so let's, uh, we're going to do this last notebook, and then we're going to go ahead and take a break again. Um, so we're going to look at synthetic databases. Um, I just wanted to highlight this PyDBGen. It's just a really cool Git rep repo someone put up. I don't even think it's in Conda or, Conda or in PIP. Um, but if you ever find yourself in need of sort of like human-oriented data, right, you need real names and ages, like, OK, sure, you can write a function to generate like sort of truly random strings, but those tend to be very easy to look at. Um, or if like your coworker needs a sample of data, but maybe, for example, you work on sensitive health data and you can't actually release the real names of your patients, but at the same time, when you're having tech discussions and you have something up on the board, you'd rather it not just be gobbledygook. Something like this can be really useful, right? So um, you can briefly look at the, co it's the source code. It's, you know, I think less than 100 lines, but we've got this class PyDB. Basically, it makes use of the faker class. So we've got a faker, a seed, a random number generator. It does bring in some extraneous information or exogenous information, a city list and a domain list so that it can do, um, generate realistic addresses and company names and things like that, which can be quite helpful. Um, and the rest of it is just sort of dealing with specific data, like do you want a simple phone number? Do you want to generate a license plate? Well, here's the sort of the style of license plate and, and so on. So, Let's do this. So if we make a DB, we can just generate some events. For example, we can generate time data. Um, so one thing to realize is you might not get the most sensible time data. It just is going to, it has a giant grab bag and it just generates things so they look reasonable. But it's not going to sort of give you internal structure. You can generate a data frame where you basically tell it what you want. So here I got some names, city, phone number, license plate, uh, time, and date. So I could imagine this could be all sorts of things. It could be when people went through sort of a a toll payment system or something like that. Um, if I wanted that, I'd probably want to make sure that, for example, 1980 made sense as like a date I would actually be capturing something. Um, random cities, I guess these look, you know, they're at least things I can pronounce rather than being like QWERTY or whatever. Uh, phone numbers look real, so if I need to say, uh, check if a data structure has enough room to store a phone number, I can grab it from here. Or if I just want to check out whatever text parsing I'm doing on my end, like maybe I'm trying to extract the area code, I now have that sample data to do it. Um, so let's take a break, but also during the break, I would ask you to attempt this exercise of modify the code above, which like I said, it's very accessible, clean, neat code, um, to see if you can add features to generate age and credit score data. But I would also like to enhance this library a little bit. So I'd like you to think about how you could if both age and credit score are available, how to make them correlated, right? Because it tends to be, at least for some subset of the population, that the older you get, you get your mortgage, you have this and that, you get like an amazing credit score, right? You get into your 50s and you're like, a million is your credit score uh, versus when you're 20 and it's like negative 35 or whatever, right? So, so see if you can replicate that in your data because I want you to see also how easily, especially uh, with object-oriented Python, you can sort of manipulate this to suit your purposes and you can have actual structure in this data. So let's go ahead and take 10 minutes to do that and also take a break. OK, real quick. So if we wanted to make some slightly socially useful contribution to this synthetic database code base, since they've been so nice to provide this for us, um, I was asking if we might be able to find a way uh, to add age and credit score, since those don't seem to be there. And those are also both very like human, excuse me, attributes. So um, mainly. I just wanted you to take a look at this to see just how readable it is. It's very straightforward code. Um, I think in this case, there's sort of no desire to be super efficient with this code, right? Because it's just really meant to be small prototypes. We're not generating hundreds of thousands of databases or uh, numbers. So it also means that it gets to be quite readable. So what I ended up doing is I just created a new class. And I'm not saying this is the only way to do it or the best way, but I just did an age credit score by DB. 
end. Most of this code has not changed, so I'm just looking for where it was. So I added a function age credit score that uses NumPy to draw from a, a multivariate normal um, with means of 55 for age and 6 to 50 for credit score. And then I stuck in the covariance matrix also, just something that popped out of my head, definitely not describing any real uh, human population in the US who has credit scores. Added age and credit, right? So if only one appears, then they can't be correlated. But if they both are, then I want them to both go through this age credit score. And then if they were both correlated and I had age credit score, I had to find a way to get that in there given that the model this operates on is it produces one series at a time. It doesn't produce data altogether. And arguably that's a failing in the sense of, oh, if you want to extend this library to have some sort of internal structure, uh, if you want to do that while also only generating one series at a time, you would have an, um, a lot of bookkeeping, right? You'd have all sorts of class objects sort of keeping track of things to add that structure back in. So for example, if we were going to redesign this class, and no criticism to the nice person who put it up for their purposes, we might say, well, if I want internal structure uh, and correlations, I really need to generate everything together. And so we'd probably sort of fundamentally alter the way this works. Uh, so that's also, it's good to keep in mind, right? Because maybe you like this functionality and this could be useful for you at work if you work with human data, but maybe you know you want structure in your data, right? So you already know you'll take this and maybe do a rewrite and maybe contribute that to the open source community. So lots of opportunities uh, to give back as well as to also save yourself some work. Uh, but the only other thing that was really necessary here was, ooh, it's behaving a little funny. Ah, uh, here we go. Uh, if we had age and credit score, then I just did this very janky swap in an age and credit score function instead of the age and credit score together. And then, of course, at the end, I had to clean that up. So if I do that, then I do indeed have the structure that I wanted in my data. So um, mainly, I just wanted to make you aware that there are so many of these beautiful little projects people have put out there. So when you have some annoying work need of generating a certain kind of data, usually someone else has had that need. You can easily find these things, and it would be great, actually, one of the things I think Python is very much missing is some sort of like realistic human uh, database generator with some kind of internal structure. So if you have many free weekends and infinite energy, that is something I would really like you to do. So just throwing that out there. OK. OK, so that's we're sort of at the end of our like sort of simulating from distributions in this sort of generic sense. As I mentioned, there's this whole sort of academic pursuit, right, of uh, Monte Carlo simulation and how do we simulate really complicated distributions, and we haven't talked about that at all, um, mainly because that is an extremely well-covered topic, especially at SciPy, so you will get lots and lots of that over the next few days, and also because um, surprisingly often that isn't actually the problems that are giving you the most trouble at work anyway, right? Like maybe if you're a Bayesian and you do Bayesian analysis all day, yes, in which case you have those packages. Uh, but otherwise, these sorts of things tend to be more time consuming, right? I need some sort of human generated data or I need some sort of data to test this clustering algorithm I'm doing. So all of that is available as we've seen this morning in the um, sklearn ecosystem and also sort of floating around the internet. Okay, so um, on to our next module, which I want to talk a bit about agent-based simulations. Okay, so agent-based simulations um, are really intuitive. And I don't know about you guys, when I first started programming, to me, this was sort of the thing I wanted to do all day, right? When you're a little kid, you think, well, what would happen if, if everybody walked faster on the sidewalk? Or what would happen if everyone was a little bit more rational? And with an agent-based simulation, arguably, you can sort of find out, right? And so social scientists, not just scientists, but social scientists really love these things when they're trying to make a point about like, oh, well, what happens if you have a jury and like one really forceful person on that jury? It's expensive to run human experiments, but we can sort of put a bunch of little computational agents in a room and lock them there for hours just like a jury and see what happens. Uh, so very much uh, the darling of a certain kind of social scientist, but they're also useful in the sciences, particularly in biology. You see all sorts of agent-based simulations, uh, for example, looking at what happens in ecology and things like that. Okay, so what do you need to know from a Python perspective? Well, Python's object-oriented approach really shines, right? So sometimes even at a Python conference, I need to you know, deliver the bad news that actually R is much better for a given task and why are we even talking about it in Python? That's certainly not true with uh, agent-based simulations, right? Actually, something like this is a real pain in the butt with R because it doesn't have that delicious, wonderful, you know, object-oriented uh, ease that we have with Python. 
Uh, it's sort of like winding up a toy model of the world and watching it roll along, right? So when would you use this is something like that. When you're thinking, this is how I speculate that certain kinds of actors, and you can have a heterogeneous assortment. It doesn't have to be all one kind of person. Um, what happens? How do they behave? I can sort of set up their environment, set up their rules of engagement. I can even set up things like their behavior can change over time, right? So that's something we tend to focus more on with machine learning models or with neural networks, right? Especially if they're allowed to evolve even after they're deployed in production. Um, but this problem is, is not new with those sorts of models, right? With agent-based simulations, also you can allow behavior to evolve. You can allow it to evolve in ways that are not fully deterministic, right? Just like humans, right? You can wind them up in a variety of ways and let them be stochastic, just like, you know, the hidden Markov model of your spouse. The interesting thing, and or sort of the holy grail with these things, is the potential for complex dynamics to emerge out of simple rules if you have enough actors or the right balance of actors, right? So those are the sorts of things you see published in academic journals, right? I, I, ha I said, you know, I'm an economist, and I set people going with this very simple rule, and I showed that I guess some sort of socially suboptimal outcome, right? Like people are selling at the wrong price, or not everyone who needs their medicine gets it based on these rules. And then you're sort of supposed to draw an inference of if we could somehow modify behavior to change these rules, we'd get a better outcome. A little bit more formally, when we think about agent-based simulations, the goal is to simulate autonomous independent actors to understand how their interactions create larger group dynamics and more complex patterns, right? So what does it look like sort of from the bird's eye view once we set these things going? Standard agent-based models will usually include features like the following, numerous independent actors, often with different subtypes, right? So if I were going to do an agent-based model of this room, I might do uh, returning SciPy attendees versus new SciPy attendees versus uh, people who just wandered in off the street, but the air conditioning is nice and everyone's so friendly and there are free snacks, right? And I, can, I could sort of do some economic model of like, what about these free riders who just wander in from, you know, the Austin heat and get some snacks, et cetera. Uh, stochastic or heuristic-based decision-making by the agents, right? So you need to set up some environment where there are meaningful decisions for them to be making or meaningful actions for them to be undertaking. You need an architecture defining how and when independent agents interact with one another. And finally, you need opportunities for learning and evolving over time. That's probably the most interesting, right? Otherwise, you might just sort of hit some equilibrium, but if you actually want to see some system evolution, you probably want your actors to be able to evolve as well. Here's another model of how these things work or how people use them more generally, right? So usually, if you're building an agent-based model, um, usually you're not building a model of like, what would a sociology of the population of bacteria on Jupiter's moons look like, right? We're not usually doing that level of imagining. Instead, these tend to be inspired by real systems, right? So like I said, often with social science, a very well-defined situation like a jury or the pharmaceuticals market, or in biology, it might be a system like this particular ecosystem with predators and prey and some kind of scarce resource like water or shelter or something like that, or um, that kind of thing where you can identify the actors in the real system. You develop your conceptual model. You try to build a model, and of course, you can never fully describe it. So one of the goals is often to see what is the minimal description you can have that can reproduce the system dynamics, right? That's another interesting thing to do with agent-based modeling. Some really complicated behaviors, it will turn out, don't require a particularly complicated model to produce, right? And actually, that's something people are studying now uh, with the deployment of machine learning algorithms on the internet. There's this theory. Uh, that even without people sort of intending to do certain things, that their algorithms are going to go out there and do them nonetheless. So for example, one concern that legal scholars have is that price setting algorithms for competitors, all of whom sort of rationally want to have the best price and are probably all looking at their competitors' prices, which is not technically illegal, may somehow end up behaving illegally in the sense that they end up behaving like some kind of cabal, right, or whatever the legal term is. They end up behaving like a price fixing scheme even though they're not. Uh, so in a way, these agent-based models are re-emerging in a whole new field looking at how machine learning is going to work sort of in the internet ecosystem. So that may be more relevant uh, to your jobs even than something like uh, how a jury deliberates. But in any case, they run these simulations. And then your model output, it can never really prove something about your model, right? This is sort of a model uh, or about your real system. It can just develop an insight, uh, tend to provide evidence, but this is never going to be sort of uh, damning proof one way or the other for a theory. So some of the limits of agent-based modeling, right? This sounds so easy uh, and wonderful and all sorts of interesting things will happen when we wind up our agents. There are plenty of limits though, right? Even apart from the fact that we just can't have all our variables in, 
There's the illusion of discrete time steps, right? Most systems in the real world don't behave as discrete time steps, right? When we're all doing our shopping, it's not as though we each coordinate every minute as to whether we'll push our button. Uh, same thing with most models that are, are, are happening. Now, that's especially important because there's also sometimes this illusion of simultaneous events, right? So if you have really like high density situations and things appear to be happening at the same time because that's how they're time stamped, you need to remember that they're not. So for example, that could be a really important distinction in some sort of like physical competition for a resource. Maybe it looks like everyone's using it, but really only one person can get it, right? And so the dynamics of how that works in continuous time can look very different. Um, you're also, you're unlikely to discover fundamentally new individual behaviors because you coded the model, right? So what you can discover are the group level dynamics, but since you programmed the agents, unless you did something really complicated or clever, your agents themselves are not going to surprise you, right? They will only surprise you in that they're encountering situations that emerged from the group behavior that you didn't necessarily know you'd see. Um, and then uh, as I mentioned, but again, uh, debates as to how much the models can be relied on to draw about the real conclusions about the real world tend to go back and forth. Uh, so these things are, are sometimes very much in vogue and then they fall out and so forth. But anyway, it's a really interesting coding problem. Um, and what I want to show you is just how you would deploy this with SymPy. Uh, this is another really cool Python module. And what's nice, I think, uh, similar to the SK Learn, right, where you could, yeah, I could write make blobs, right? There's nothing sort of mind-blowingly difficult about it. But if I would write it, that would be sort of 30 lines of a massive for loop, and I'm sort of writing out all these things by hand, and it's really annoying, right? Same thing here. We can imagine doing this, right? I could sort of write out all these agents, and I could sort of write some kind of infrastructure to coordinate them all, and maybe I would have some kind of like heap or something to sort of keep events in time, and I would somehow have to figure out how to have them talk to each other and maybe have like a whole dictionary of how they could talk to each other. Sure, I can code all of that up, right? And maybe my programming would get really good after doing that for months, or I can just use a module, which is what we're going to do now so that we're just aware of there being a really nice handy module. So let's go to the next notebook. Somehow I closed my browser, huh? So go into the, uh, the folder that's called agent-based modeling, and there's only uh, one Python notebook in there. Agent-based. OK. Uh, so my goal is, is for us to just jump right into using SymPy rather than uh, worrying about the details. But a high-level overview with SymPy is you have sort of different kinds of things. So you have like a resource which is sort of something that everybody wants to access but is not infinite, right? So a resource could be something like uh, the check-in counter at SciPy, right? They can only handle, say, three people at a time, even though 100 people want to use them. You have a process, which is like your independent agent. So we would all be processes walking around uh, this kind of simulation world, right? So a process is sort of like an individual. The resource is what you want to access. And then finally, you need an environment. And an environment is like the world. It's like the thing running it. It's the matrix, right? It's where you sort of set everything in motion. So that's really all you need to know to get started. So we're going to start with a simple example, not a simpler example. OK. Uh, so we're going to first just simulate a car. And what does this car do? Nothing especially interesting. It parks and it drives. It parks and it drives. That is the car's entire life. So we are going to define a function. And this function takes an environment and a number. And the number actually just turns out to be the car's ID number. It's just who the car is. We're just going to call it car number one. Uh, so I'm going to define this method. And you see what it uses? It's using the yield, right? That's how it interacts with its environment is via yield, right? So what does this look like? It looks just like a coroutine, right? It looks like something where it's in some way interacting with some other object to coordinate behavior. Great. Um, Turns out that all I need to run this simulation is this line of this stuff, which I could even make simpler, right? This, this is all me just sort of having custom code to define what I want to do. And then my environment. And what's my environment? It's a simpy environment. I set up a process, which is this car, right? So the environment wants functions to run. So I give it the function to run. And I tell it to run for time 150. And that time can mean anything I want it to mean. It can be minutes. It can be hours. It's just sort of how I'm defining it in my head. It's time steps. So if I do that. This is what I see. 
I've got parking at zero, driving at five, and then it parked at 26, drive at 30, and so on, right? So instead of me having to somehow figure out how to code this up, my environment just took care of it as long as it, I gave it one stage. Now at this point you're thinking, well, I probably could have done this with the same amount of code on my own. That's true for one car, but how would I do that for multiple cars, right? If I did that for multiple cars myself and had to somehow keep track of multiple cars moving through this environment, I'd have to have some kind of array of the cars, I'd have to check on them all the time. That's where your infrastructure really blows up, right? Is when you're trying to coordinate. Or instead, I can simply let the environment uh, do that. So in this case, I have three cars, and now we begin to see a bit more sort of complexity emerging, right? So now I have car one, car two, car three. And you'll notice that, okay, fine, at first, car one, car two, and car three park in that order. That's how they went in. But after that, it is not deterministic, right? And this is actually, going back to when we very much started, right? This is random number draws. So my random number is still coming into this system. This is a deterministic simulation in the sense of the agents have deterministic heuristics about what they're going to do, but then the numbers governing those heuristics, right? How long do you stay parked? How long do you drive? That's coming from the random number generator. And which random number generator? The one we looked at, you know, two hours ago when we started. Okay, so we're already seeing a bit of interesting behavior, but uh, not how I want to spend my life. I don't want to spend my life thinking about how cars drive, right? So this is just, okay, this is good. You know, this gives me a way very simply with just a few lines of code uh, to have many agents sort of going around in the world. Okay, so now I want to do something uh, a little bit more complex. And actually, this is one lake, not three lakes. Uh, so I'm, we're going to simulate a situation. Uh, I am not a biologist, but this is sort of what I imagined, um, where we have animals who need to drink, eat, and reproduce, right? That's sort of their purpose in life. And they live in this wonderful environment, maybe a little bit like Austin, where they've got plenty of food. Maybe they eat scorpions and tarantulas all day. Uh, but they are water limited, which I imagine Austin is, although maybe I'm just generalizing about Texas. Uh, so they're water limited. There's only this one lake, and the lake can only accommodate a couple of animals at a time, right? So they're all busy eating, reproducing, eating, reproducing, but every so often they get really thirsty and they have to wait their turn in line for the lake. So that's what we're going to simulate here. Um, these numbers, just random numbers, these have no truth in biology, but I said, uh, you know, setting a parameter for the mean time to drink. I said, let's do 600 steps, you know, drink minimum 120, uh, you know, and then mean and sigma for the normal distributions I'm going to use for drinking, eating, and reproducing. I've also got this tree growing duration because I have this idea that when the lake is not busy nourishing animals, if they're not around, it's somehow nourishing little trees and pushing trees into the world. So again, we have a little bit more complexity. Um, so we're going to go ahead and define those. Define just a helper function time two, so I can just pull my random draws for my activity. Uh, the activities are going to be going to the lake, which is separate from drinking. Why is it separate from drinking? Because the lake is capacity limited. You can go to the lake, but if there's a line, you have to get on the line. Um, and then th everything else, uh, reproducing and eating, those apparently do not involve waiting. Those you can just do whenever you want in this natural environment. Uh, but they are time consuming. So I would point out, for example, that reproduction takes you know, a mean of 200 time steps versus drinking takes a mean of five versus eating takes a mean of 10, right? So if you think about sort of the numerical distribution of how these animals spend their time, um, and they do not do both at once, although you can build that into this model too if you wanted to get more complicated. So we've got an animal. It needs an environment because it's going to be one of these processes, right? It needs a world to live in. It needs a name just so that we know what to call it. In this case, we're going to use uh, the object-oriented aspect of Python to also keep track of its offspring. We're going to let each animal track its history. There are actually ways with this package to have sort of external trackers. It's almost a little bit like the Truman Show, like you set people going in the world, and then you also have cameras to take a look at them. So if you're old enough to remember the Truman Show, uh, that is sort of how that would work as well. But in this case, we're going to let each, each animal count it themselves. And what it's going to do is it's going to kick off its process into the environment, right? It needs to basically sort of register with the environment and say, hey, environment, I want to run this process of I am, you know, I am self.living. I am living my life. And the only thing I really need you, the environment, to coordinate for me is this lake access, because lake access is really important to me. And then separately, it's going to kick off with the environment. And this, this is sort of like this this process it doesn't have control over is self-drink from lake. And what this is going to do is it's going to interrupt the animal when it gets really thirsty and the animal has no choice. It gets interrupted. It has to go get online at the lake. No choice. It has to stop reproducing or eating or whatever it's doing. 
So if we look at this structure, if we're, if we're busy living, then we're going to have just this wild true loop, right? Like basically it just keeps doing these things except when it's thirsty or when it dies, although I did not put death into this model. I mean, you can imagine all sorts of ways you would elaborate on this that can all go into this framework. Um, but the important thing is the yields, right? Yielding into the environment. So while you're living, First, you need to, you start by eating, right? The way these animals work is they eat and they reproduce, right? You sort of eat enough to reproduce, then you can lay your egg and boom, you know, you've reproduced and you can start the whole cycle again. Uh, so starting with the time you need to eat, then while there is still time in that counter, you start trying to eat, right? You tell the environment, I need X time to eat. And you are allowed to continue eating um, and be done, set that to zero, unless you get an interruption. And why do you get an interruption? you get an interruption when you are told to drink from the lake. So if you are told to drink from the lake, which just sort of happens periodically outside of your control, in that case, then you have a timeout. And actually, we want to go back to your personalized go to lake time. So in this case, you are also going to interrupt yourself. So this bit of code here, which is so unobtrusive, is actually really powerful because what this is doing it has the environment recognizing that this autonomous agent is doing multiple things and it prioritizes. So it will literally interrupt one method with an error, stop that method and go to another method, right? This sort of functionality, if you wanted to write it yourself, absolutely you can, but it becomes a pain in the butt, right? Because you have to keep track of all these processes so that you can have them talk to each other and act appropriately, or you can use a beautiful out of the box solution and it just sort of works, which is fantastic. So if you get interrupted to go drink from the lake, then you're in this regime, right? So then it turns out you are thirsty, you have done some eating, so you can sort of take that out of your to-do list. You say, oh, I got to eat for two minutes, so now you know maybe I had nine minutes to eat, but now I've only got seven more. Uh, now I have to go to the lake and ask for permission, basically go check at the lake, is there room for me, the autonomous agent who needs to drink? This yield rec is gonna be doing a lot of the work. This is where it is just waiting to be told that it gets that lake access, right? So. This could actually mean that there's a really long queue and these agents are waiting a really long time as time is passing, or it can mean they get lake access immediately, right? The nice thing again is because there's this package and we don't need to coordinate it, we don't need to run that queue to know who's waiting and how long they're going to take, but it is happening in real time. Just like sort of a video game where the things that you're not even paying attention to off frame sort of continue from our programming perspective. Okay, so that's the eating loop. The reproducing loop is the exact same thing. The idea is you need to reproduce unless you get interrupted to go drink, then you'll go drink and then you'll come back and continue reproducing, you know, making your egg or whatever it is you're doing. Uh, so same structure. So not especially complicated, but you know, this is arguably some, you know, approximate first order model of how some group of animals might behave sort of living in the burbs of Austin. Okay, so we define this. We're also, just for kicks, like I said, going to imagine that this lake has so much water and is, is not overly in demand, so when the water is not going to the animals, it can go to nourish cute little saplings. So in addition to managing resources for other entities, this also gives you the opportunity to manage access from different kinds of entities, right? So the animals versus the trees, and you can coordinate that as well. Okay, so let's actually run a simulation, right? I told you how easy it is, and then I showed you like 100 lines of boilerplate code, and then it begins to look a little less easy, but the point is, is once you've defined those classes, we come down here. Uh, we just had a couple of constants, like how long do I want to sim? Uh, random seed, not really necessary, but it can be, can be nice to know. Trees grown, just so I can keep a counter. Uh, lake capacity and number of animals. So in this first case, I am, I'm just gonna say, well, let's just have two animals. And that, you know, it's almost not even an interesting case, right? Because if I have just two animals, are they in any way resource constrained? No, right, because I said the lake can hold six animals. So let's start with the non-resource constrained case. And this is where we're beginning to already explore, right? So then rather than having to sort of code this up and sort of introspect in my head and maybe worry I have biases about how I imagine this would play out, I can just watch it play out. Okay, oh, animal zero and one made one offspring. I think this is probably why I did this. Ah, here we go. So. Animal zero made four offspring, animal one made three offspring. So if they're not resource constrained, they don't need to wait, that's how many offspring they can get. And why is that? Because they're still constrained, right? They're time constrained, they need to eat, eating takes non-zero non, non amount of time, they need to reproduce, that takes non-zero amount of time. So if this is all the life they get, that is all the offspring they can have. Uh, what if I up this? What do we think will happen with four animals? 
How many, how many offspring will those other animals have? Less? Why? Is there a cue? Yeah, so that I don't, there's no cue yet. So my first guess would be that there should be the same number. Let's see though. Okay, so there is the same number in this case. And you'll notice sometimes it's four, sometimes it's three. Why is that? Because we put in that stochastic element related to generating random numbers to describe how much time did you need to eat. It's not exactly 10, it's like 10 give or take, right? So there's our stochastic element. Okay, um, likewise, we probably, if we have six exactly, um, oops, oops. If we have six exactly, that also, it looks like fours and threes, fours and threes, in which it is, uh, is a bit different. Let's now look at the resource constrained case. So let's kick this up to 10 and let's see if it matters, right? Will it necessarily matter? No, right? There, things can be resource constrained, but if people or agents don't all need them at the same time, it still works out, right? Somewhat like airport bathrooms are fine most of the time, except when they're not, right? Or, you know, subways are fine, except at rush hour, although that's a terrible example. Um, so look, it, it turns out even with 10, I mean, they may or may not be taking a hit, right? Maybe they're taking a hit. It's only a slight hit, if so, right? So like, this is even if you're doing city planning or traffic planning or things like that, when you start thinking, how many bathrooms do I actually need in this airport? Or how many seats do I actually need in this lecture hall, right? Uh, you can do this sort of modeling to think about what that's going to look like, among other kinds of modeling for those problems. Okay. So my first exercise for you guys is I'd like you to consider an extreme situation where we would eventually get fewer offspring, even as there are more animals. And I don't just mean um, fewer offspring, even as there are more animals. I don't just mean fewer offspring per animal. My question for you is, is it possible that you even just get fewer offspring total? Can you have fewer offspring, even as you have a bigger population? And does it, you know, does this, to first order, does this agent-based simulation allow us to answer that question? So take two minutes, uh, should be a, a fairly uh, simple modification to the code, and see what answer you get. Okay, so in this case, I'm, I'm, I'll be curious what other folks did. I just put in 200, I thought, let me really blow this number up and see what happens. Um, and actually, you can get to the case where there are, there are no offspring at all, even though you have many animals. So somehow the lake is so constrained that nobody ever, ever gets to reproduce because they're all just waiting online for water. Okay, so that's some sort of parade of horribles example. Uh, the next question we could ask, next exercise, is sort of given this model of the world, right, how would you determine sort of the number of offspring produced by all of the population as a function of the size of that population, right? So in this case, I just said, well, if I really max it out, we don't get any animals. But you can still ask, okay, if maybe this is some sort of like semi-wild animal that I'm farming and I want to know like where am I going to get the best returns on my money? Obviously, I don't want to have 200 animals because I won't breed anything. I'll have nothing to sell. Um, given these constraints, what number, like what size population would I want to sort of maximize my profit if I'm like a meerkat farmer or whatever it is, right? So how would you modify this code to answer that question? Take a couple minutes. Okay, so let's take a look at this together. So how would you determine the number of offspring produced by a sim as a function of the number of animals? So I, again, not knowing anything about population dynamics, but that's part of the beauty of this sort of thing is you might not be a biologist, but you might be able to contribute something nonetheless with your programming skills or at least get a sense of what they see in the wild. Uh, so I decided let's just try a wide range of numbers of animals and the only thing I needed to do was kick this into a for loop and just have some kind of record keeping. Um, and I came up with something like this, right? So if, um, if these are the number of offspring, I'm trying 2, 10, 20, 50, 100, 150, 200, uh, these are the numbers I see, and, and I seem to get some sort of peak around 50 animals. That's where I'm going to get the most offspring. I'm curious if anyone observed anything else, or if you tried other numbers that showed interesting dynamics. Uh, what's wrong with this approach so far? Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to my boss and say, go buy 50 meerkats, and we're definitely done, right? There's, well, there's many, many limits to this, but what's, like, the obvious one right now? I just added 50 to the population. That's one problem, right? So I haven't sort of had those agents spin off into other agents. For example, I didn't ask my boss, or maybe I'm the farmer, either way, 
like, are we going to sell all those offspring right away? Or are we going to let them breed? Or are we going to do some mix of that, right? So that would be one elaboration I should do. Uh, what else? I've only run one simulation, right? I should never, ever, ever run just one simulation if I'm going to even make even the slightest assertion about what something looks like, right? So each of these, right, it seems like, oh, I'm simulating a lot. I simulated, you know, 1,000 or 10,000 steps. But it's actually still just one trajectory, right? That just re represents one thing that could have happened with that population among many. So I would really want to run each of these simulations for each sort of starting population size many, many times. How many times? Well, I could bootstrap, right? And I could say, well, what kind of, you know, sample uncertainty do I want? And sort of back out from there what feels appropriate for my use case, right? And that's sort of a skill you use in general in your daily working life, I imagine. Um, anything else? What else could go wrong with using this? Mm hmm So, such as? Uh, we don't know how the cats, how territorial they are with each other, but the cats may have some social interactions they like with each other, whether there's other animals uh, or predators that they're going to be as well. So the, these are all things. And what's interesting is I think with the tools we already have, we could put all of that in, right? So thinking about, well, how do they interact with predators or prey? We could easily have other classes of animals, and maybe some of those classes could interrupt others, right? We have this interrupt process. You interrupt when you get thirsty. We could readily have you interrupt to go kill somebody, right? You interrupt their process because you just ate them and they're gone. Or you know, you get interrupted by this, pred this prey, and you're like, oh, that looks delicious, and I think I'll eat that, and you spend a bit of time doing that, right? So we could easily simulate predator-prey dynamics. Um, you also mentioned territories, right? Maybe they're territorial. There could be ways to do that, right? And there'd be so many ways to do that. One is that we could, just like the lake is a limited resource with limited capacity, we could have territories which have limited capacity, um, and maybe that capacity would only be one. Or maybe we could do something, again, biology-inspired and say, well, maybe it's the structure where there's like one male and many, many females, like a harem structure or something. And so we could have a capacity that allows a different number of females and males, right? And we could get more and more detailed and more and more specific to a, a certain kind of animal, right? And how detailed we want to get, that's where we'd have to have our domain factors of, okay, let me go talk to a meerkat farmer. I just made that up. I don't know if that exists. And, you know, find out from that person what, you know, when they're making these assessments just sort of in their head heuristically, what factors do they use? Because those would be the first ones I'd want to put in. Uh, but main point here is we'd want to run this more than once because as we saw, even just running it a few times, there's still a stochastic element because we are still running this. Even though the, the behaviors so far are deterministic, um, the time waiting is already introducing that stochastic element. Okay, so my next exercise for you, uh, we didn't talk about this, but this is another possibility. Um, can we put some learning into this model? So is it possible for the animals to sort of get more efficient somehow over time so that they can spend less time waiting online for the lake? And what does that look like? So go ahead and think about what your version of making an animal. So just sort of take the existing code Make the animal smarter in some way so that it wastes less time uh, drinking and waiting online and spends more time, say, eating and reproducing. And what would that look like? And remember, learning would mean in some way the behavior has to change over time. And, and preferably, learning usually means you get smarter over time rather than dumber over time, although that, that can happen too. So a couple of minutes. OK, so I'm just interested. Uh, what are people doing to make their animals smarter over time? What are some options? You could. You could check the API and, and see if that's available. You could check the queue size. I believe there's a queue size function. So they could learn to check if it's available. Uh, but what if I say, but thirst is like this ineluctable force, and you don't, you don't get to not get online? What are some other ways? I mean, that's definitely one way. I'm just ha trying to have us brainstorm other ways. You could drink faster. You can, you know, and that would just mean changing a variable in your stochastic sampling. Uh, you might be able to learn to skip the line, right? So you can check if this uh, capacity has some sort of priority, and maybe you sort of earn some badge over time, and you're smarter, and you get to skip the line. Uh, you might just drink faster. Now that won't cut down too much, uh, but it'll, it'll cut down some. 
Um, you can also just use other strategies. So maybe you can't get off the line. Maybe you can't get better at that, but you can get really fast at reproducing, right? So instead of uh, taking 200 time steps to reproduce, maybe you only take five. You just got so good at pushing those eggs out or whatever. Uh, so the point is, is that agent-based models have a million different options you can take. Um, it's, it's, it reminds me a bit of neural networks. Like there's just a million different architectures you can imagine, and they all might be interesting. And that's, again, where you have to go back to your domain knowledge. Uh, so I, I did something really simple. I just said, uh, when you get interrupted, actually, I, I took your approach of, um, or a similar approach of like, just don't go to the lake, basically, right? So I, I decided my animals over time, as they gain experience, they are sometimes able to skip the lake, right? So maybe they feel thirsty, but they somehow have like learned to cope with that pain, and they just go on with it. And they sort of alternate whether they go or not. Uh, so over time, they earn that experience. So... Uh, let's see if that made any difference, right? So now I, I do the same thing I did, right? I look at the number of animals and look at the number of offspring. Um, hold on, I think. Let's see, did I put this in? Smart animal. Do I have smart animals? Yes. Okay, so, so in this case, we see that they're often deciding to skip drinking. Here we go. Um, and we see that actually the number of offspring goes up compared to when they weren't smart, right? So this as a farmer, I can say, oh, if my animals get smarter over time, I will actually do better. And that's actually something you hear about if you speak to people in agriculture. Uh, they really like to have like an experienced cow in the pack and stuff like that, and that actually does help. So you know, there, there you go. If you're looking for justification to buy a really fancy cow or meerkat to lead your pack, you might be able to show that you actually will make more money. Um, okay, and then final point I wanted to make, but we don't need to belabor this. Uh, what if we wanted to have sort of differential improvement, right? Just like we see in natural selection at work. Some animals get smarter and get better at reproducing, but not all. And you could ask questions like, well, is that actually like when I'm the farmer, is that maybe better, right? Maybe when I'm the farmer, I don't want all animals to get better and smarter. Maybe it's actually good to have kind of dumb animals and smart animals. And somehow that enables a better distribution of how many babies I get out of this. So we can also look at that, uh, simulate that sort of... Um, opportunistically smart animals, and we can compare these numbers, right? Uh, right now, they look about the same, and of course, I'm only doing one run, so I'd really want to do many, many of these runs and look at the overall distributions of these simulations. But this is just a very simple example. Um, I hope what you saw here is, uh, firstly, that we can start addressing real-world practical questions in a variety of domains. Uh, because we're also sampling and generating data, we can get some sense of the probability distributions, even though these are complicated, highly nonlinear dynamics. Uh, so we can have all sorts of plots to show people, like, these are my actual assumptions. I can demarcate them out. This is exactly how it works. And if this is how it works, these are the distributions I get. And then based on that slide, I showed you um, where are we? This slide, um, you can then sort of use that as a feedback, right? So we go back to our meerkat farmer with, you know, X, Y, and Z results. We say, oh, well, we find out if you have smart and not smart ones, you might do a little bit better than if they're all smart. And they might come and tell you, well, no, I, I tried that and it doesn't work in practice because you, got, you forgot factor Z or, or what have you. Uh, so this can be sort of an iterative solution, uh, useful for sort of figuring out how things work and making predictions. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to move into our next component which is a, a science simulation, and in particular, we're going to work on a physics simulation. Um, thinking about sort of physical sciences or science-driven simulations, I'm guessing some people in this room even work on these, and these are old hat to you. Uh, here are some areas where they're pretty common. So epidemiology, right? Epidemiologists uh, have all sorts of extremely complicated models. One fairly uh, simple one is the SEER model of epidemics, where you sort of have a series of differential equations saying, oh, like, how much this is going to spread is a function not just of how resistant people are, but also a function of, say, how many people had it in the past. And so this is sort of a time series type simulation where things that are happening in the past will sort of change the outcome over time. You can also have sort of physics simulations, right, statistical mechanics, where you have many particles, which can even sort of sound like an agent-based modeling system, right? Maybe my little molecules can be uh, agents. You can also have sort of quantum systems where you're uh, simulating based on a series of differential equations and thinking if these differential equations are true, uh, much like the epidemiology models, what does that look like and how do those dynamics change over time? Or you can look at things like climatology uh, 
climatology predictions, right, where they basically have a grid over the whole Earth, and they have some kind of stochastic sampling of that grid, and again, many, many differential equations, right? I think differential equations are, are pretty common in this area, regardless of, of which science you do. Uh, but there's a fairly simple model that uh, many sort of first and second year uh, grad students and even undergrads work through uh, that's really tractable computationally, and that's pretty cool that we're going to look at, called the Ising model. Uh, there are different version of, versions of this. You could have 1D, 2D, 3D, and so on. Uh, the 1D was sort of solved in the 1920s. I think it's, it's interesting that the 2D solution wasn't solved in the sense of thinking about what this system looks like at different temperatures until the 1940s. Why? Well, um, in part, they wanted the analytic solution, which is not so easy to come by, and you know they didn't all have nice laptops like we have. Uh, whereas now, I don't you know, need to know really much about physics at all, but I can still benefit from getting some insights here. Uh, the 3D lattice, incidentally, turns out to be uh, really hard and does not have a solution. So that's why we're not doing the 3D, for example. OK, so what does this look like? This is a model of magnetism where you basically say, we're going to think about a solid in the form of a lattice, which turns out to, incidentally, not actually be a very unrealistic situation when you're trying to describe a solid anyway, although it might not be a nice square lattice like I'm depicting here. But we're going to have a nice square lattice. We are going to look at the total magnetization as the sum of these individual spins, right? So these are sort of my individual molecules, but then I'm thinking about that as a global whole, right? So I have, you know, like I have this magnetic apple. The apple as a whole, does this have some sort of magnetic property, right? Does it interact with other magnetic objects or not? And it turns out that thinking about whether that will happen I can, be, can be explained by thinking about the individual sites. So we're going to think about the magnetization of the object as the sum of the individual particles. And what governs what these particles are going to do? Well, maybe they just sort of come into being in some sort of randomly distributed state. But then, since they're situated in a lattice, these uh, particles, these individual spins, have interactions with each other. And their energy is going to be governed by whether they are aligned or whether they are not aligned. And the interesting behavior uh, that people used that they were trying to explain with this was that they noticed that magnetization uh, was something in, in ferromagnetic objects that disappeared with warmer temperatures, right? So you could cool down an object and make it a magnet, and then you could warm it up, and it wasn't a magnet anymore. And uh, maybe if you're a physicist, that seems all sort of normal, but certainly in the 20s, that was like, whoa, what is going on here? That's really magical, and, and how can we explain that? Okay. Uh, so I think I covered this. It's a relatively simple model, um, not easy to solve analytically, but very easy to get some computing insights. And it's going to explain the existence of this critical temperature, as I explained, you know, above which you lose your magnetic properties. OK. So let's take a look at um, this is in the folder. I think it's called Physics Sim or something like that. Let's see. Yes, Physics Sim. OK, so if we look at the Physics Sim or the student version, the first thing we're going to do is we are going to uh, set up our lattice. And uh, you can make yours larger if you like. I happen to have a very, very weak laptop. So I'm going to keep this to be like a really tiny little ferromagnet, uh, 5 by 5. And the thing that's going to be interesting after we set up the code is we're going to really be looking at temperature, right? Because that's the behavior we, we're seeking to understand is how come temperature interacts with magnetism. OK. So I have this random block. And the first thing I need to do is initialize it. And as I mentioned, we're positing a world in which these things, maybe they're just sort of automatically assembled in, in some random way, right? You know, like the god of our environment comes down and sort of assigns spin states to each one. Um, and notice again, right, that this goes back to what we started with at the beginning of this tutorial a few hours ago. Look, np.random.choice. There I go again, going back to that np.random. This is all, at the end of the day, just based on that one random number generator from 0 to 1 uniform. It all comes back to that, always. Um, okay, so here's where there's a tiny little bit of physics, right? Uh, two things. I think the easier thing is that the magnetization for state, right? The overall magnetization, when I'm thinking how magnetic is my apple, I'm just going to sum up those spins at every little molecule on my apple. Luckily, this apple that I have is only 5 by 5. It's only 25 spots. So that's reasonably easy to do. And then I also have this function, the cost for center state. So the idea here is that sort of the energetics of that center state depend on its neighbor. And in particular, the energy depends on sort of the neighbor's magnetization or spin times that particle's magnetization or spin. So to go back to the slides, 
when I'm thinking, for example, about this particle here, this red one, where I'm waving my mouse, we're going to posit that its energy to first order has to do with how well aligned it is with this one, this one, this one, and this one, the ones above. So already you see I'm simplifying, right? Because what am I not thinking about? I'm already ignoring the diagonals, right? Do I have any reason to? No, it just makes my model simpler. I'm just going to say, you know, my first order physics tells me that everything is just these immediate neighbors and I'm not going to worry about the other. So there's already, we're seeing sort of a limitation to this model and you can say, well, how can you expect realistic behavior uh, when you're already sort of ruling things out quite obviously and I'm, I'm going to say, well, amazingly, it still works. So that's what we're going to get to. Uh, but that's this cost for center state, right? So this is the energetics around just the one particle rather than around all of them. Okay, so now we, ha now we have the bit in our system where we actually have to sort of wind this system up and set it running. And so to do that, we have two things. We have a, a MCMC adjust, which is a way of deciding, looking at a particular site, should we flip that site? Is that something we would expect to happen physically, right? And we have two ways of deciding. Um, the first is we look at sort of the energetic cost, right? And if we say, actually, this thing is in like an, a very energetically unfavorable configuration, we're going to flip it, right? Because that's what happens in nature. Systems like to be in the lowest possible energy configuration they can. It's the reason we all like to just sort of lay around when we can. It's literally the same thing. It's lower energy. It's an easier system to maintain. Same thing for particles, right? So they would rather be in the lowest possible uh, energetic system. But there is some limit on that, right? Because if that were true, you wouldn't even really have human life or any life at all. We would all just be sludge on the floor because that would be the lowest energetic state. Um, so you also have these sort of equilibrium, right? And one of them comes from the fact that we don't have zero temperature, right? We actually have a temperature that's above zero, meaning there's some energy floating around in the universe and it has to go somewhere. One of the places it can go is into putting a spin into the energetically disfavorable uh, location, right? And that's where we already get some insight into why magnetism might disappear over time. As we raise the temperature, that energy needs to go somewhere. As it goes into the system, it manifests as being in energetically higher states rather than lower states. Um, the way we see this sort of manifested is this, is, this is sort of the main logic of the whole simulation, right? If it's energetically favorable, we're just gonna switch. On the other hand, even if it's energetically unfavorable to switch out of a current state, we may actually do that proportional to some exponential probability, right? So we say, this, if we pick a random number and that random number is less than this exponential of the cost times beta, where beta is the temperature, then we are going to switch to. Um, so in physics, you would call this the balance equation. This also looks like more general Monte Carlo simulation techniques. So you've probably recognized it from that. Uh, but that's all the logic. That's also though where, where we're gonna get that stochastic part of our system, right? So again, here's our np.random.random. .random. Here it pops up again, right? We've been seeing this thing all morning because that's what everything is built on. So we can run our state. And then if we do run our state, the first thing we're gonna do is initialize our state and take a look at it. If we do that, right, if things are sort of randomly initialized, we have some pluses and some minuses, right? Things are sort of randomly aligned. Uh, being humans, we can always stare at things and decide they're not so random, right? This one doesn't look so random to me, but I promise you it is, right? We used np.random. Um, and then we want to run the state. So what do we think is going to happen? Well, if I run this state, after a thousand steps, I have come to a uniform uh, magnet, right? So now my, my apple, which was all scattered, is now definitely a magnet. All the magnetism is pointing in one direction. And if I look, this is what happened, right? The, ma the overall magnetism started around zero. Things were randomly distributed. So if I summed them all up, it wasn't a very magnetic object as a global object. Um, but actually, very rapidly, it did become a, a quite magnetic object. So why is that? Why did this happen so quickly? Well, if I go up here, my temperature is actually extremely low. So then I can say, OK, well, what if, what if I make this temperature like an order of magnitude bigger? What does that look like? That should be actually fairly dramatic, because we're looking at exponential distributions reinitialize with a random state. So in this case, right, if my, if my temperature goes up by a factor of 10, I don't seem to be making any progress, or there doesn't seem to be any magnetism, right? So we've already found a way of explaining how does this temperature issue relate to this magnetism issue. And then if we plot the magnetism again, um, in this case, and this very much reflects what you will see in the physical world, right? If it's warm enough, your system is not going to coalesce into any sort of ordered system because the energy that's sort of available in the universe just keeps kicking these things out of their energetically favorable state. Okay. 
Um, so my first exercise here is I would ask you to modify the simulation code above to visualize the magnetization, this sort of curve like this, right? You get one per test run uh, for 100 test runs, right? So if I wanted to see if I run this 100 times, um, and I probably wouldn't pick this temperature. I would, you know, go back to the low temperature regime. Uh, so five is too high. Uh, we were at 0.5 before. Maybe try something like one, whatever you like. Um, but think about how to modify this code to just get, uh, you know, a better view of what goes on, right? We took just one sample. How would I take many samples? Okay, so let's take a look at this one together. So um, we didn't really need to modify anything so much as just kick this into a for loop again to see what that looks like and find a way to keep track of these results. So I just stuck them in a list. Um, and if we do that, here's what we see. Does this reflect what others saw? Okay, so, so what is it that we're seeing here? What is this telling us? This, you could interpret it as a giant mess. So, the, mm -hmm. so um, this, is, this is almost like a 2D histogram, right, of, say, time versus value. Uh, one, you know, easy, lazy way to do that is just stick them all on top of each other with a low alpha value. Um, and what we see is you can either go positive or negative, and these seem to happen about equally often, which makes sense, right, because there was nothing in our simulation that privileged one or the other. Uh, for starters, we don't have, say, an external magnetic field. That might be like the environment in some way telling the system you really want to point this way more than that way. That's something you could add into your model if you wanted to make it more complicated. Uh, so we see they're about equally likely. And we could also, if we wanted to, we could even sort of extrapolate some kind of characteristic half-life or something like that if we wanted to. We could even fit to these curves in turn, right? So the output for our simulation could in turn become a source of analysis about this system. But what we see here is it's either going to go positive or negative, and it's going to do it pretty rapidly, at least at this temperature. Uh, so the next thing I would ask you to do is to uh, generate a curve of the absolute value of the magnetization, right? We realize we're interested in the absolute value because we don't care if it goes positive or negative. We just care about that, uh, the magnitude of that magnetization at step 100, right? Because again, look, looking here, it doesn't look like we need to go that far out to sort of find out where we end up in most cases, right? It's very rare for the system uh, to still be wandering around. It seems to get to one spot and stay there. Uh, so try that for the following temperatures, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 1, 2, 5, and so on, um, and see what that plot looks like. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave you with another uh, minute or two, but just quick question. So what do we need to change to be able to run this simulation as compared to the original code? Okay, so you need an absolute value to look at your magnetization, right? Before this, we, ha we had been a little naive. We hadn't realized that that didn't matter. Uh, what else, though? We're looking at the temperature dynamics. Where do the temperature dynamics play out in the code? Where do they matter? Yeah, so there's this beta term, and that affects whether we make transitions that are energetically disfavored, right? So energetically favored transitions don't seem to matter from a temperature perspective by this model, but energetically disfavored uh, transitions do, right? That's this code in the MCMC adjust. So that's what you need to do to modify this code to make it temperature aware. You need your MCMC adjust to take that beta value, right, because it's not going to be hard coded anymore. You need to be able to pass it a variety of values because the behavior we're really studying now with the temperature dependence essentially boils down to just this line, right? How often are we going to switch into that energetically disfavored uh, position? So go ahead and take another minute or two, and then we'll look at the outcome. Okay, so let's take a look at this together. Um, I just dumped the temperatures that I wanted to try into a list. As I mentioned, the main thing we need to do is to adjust our MCMC adjust function so that it takes that beta as an input parameter, right? Because we're looking at the dynamics of what happens when we change the calculus here, um, which just means we need that beta to get passed in earlier in our pipeline. And then again, that looks like a for loop. And this one is going to take a little bit of time And then if we, if we plot what happens here, as far as our magnetization goes, um, what I have happening is a really high magnetization that rapidly plunges. And then it seems to go up again, 
What's going on there? Is that a physics insight? Let's go, let's go back to my code, right? So I have a result, and then for each temperature in temps, I run a simulation 20 times, and then I take the average magnetization in those 20 times at the very end of my histogram, and that's what I get. I wouldn't think that means anything, right? 20 times is just not a lot. I was a little bit lazy here. I thought, oh, let me make it fast. Um, but look, if I run it again, my curve can look very different, right? So this should just be a warning in these systems. Uh, sometimes you might think you're discovering some really interesting behavior, but actually you're just looking at, you know, sample noise invariance and really mundane things. Okay. Uh, and then just a thought experiment. What might an agent-based model look like when applied to this model? Right? If I wanted to, instead of using sort of a physically driven model, I don't know any physics, so I, I just know a little bit about energetically favorable or not, but I don't know about some detailed balance equation. How might I do this as an agent-based model? What would the agents be? So the magnetic poles would be the agents. And what would their worldview look like? Do they have a limited resource? So they can see the magnets surrounding them. So they have like sort of a, a geographic environment, which is something we discussed doing with our animals, but we didn't. So we might think about having um, some additional structure there. So we would have agents, but they would be placed somewhere geographically. They would see their neighbors. That would be their environment. Uh, maybe their neighbors would sort of interrupt them, right? So when your neighbor switches pole, you know, polarity, then you might get some sort of interruption and, you know, have some sort of heuristic of, oh, should I switch too? What would be interesting about an agent-based model compared to this model? Anyone notice some weird or non-physical stuff here that we might be able to improve on? So like one thing here um, is for each time step, we only pick one lattice site. So basically one time step is one individual lattice deciding whether to switch. But that's probably not how the physical system works, right? It's not as though atoms are sort of saying, oh, it's your turn to decide whether to switch. Oh, it's your turn to decide whether to switch, right? We don't expect that. Uh, so we could in some ways make it more physical by having an agent-based uh, modeling system, which is not usually how people think about, say, a physically driven system, but you could have that. And then what you would have is more sort of things that appear to happen contemporaneously. Uh, what else could you do with an agent-based model that we're not doing here? Okay, so you could... You wouldn't have to have a lattice anymore, right? You could, with the same model, be much more uh, flexible about what you're looking at, right? So uh, magnets don't just occur in solids, they occur in gases as well, um, and that's actually quite a relevant area if we ever want to solve fusion, so that actually could be something important to do. Uh, what else could we do? Okay, so how would that be different as compared to this? Well, it, but it's an. Absolutely. And I, I think for me to rephrase what you were saying, and again say it, but just with a different way of saying it, because many things could then happen at the same time, the time behavior we see would be actual time behavior versus right now what we're really seeing as time is just visiting different lattice sites. Right? So again, then we could start thinking about what does the temporal behavior really look like. Whereas here, we're really just watching to see if something settles into equilibrium or not, and it's not really a time series. OK, great. Um, so yes, I just want to point out, people really think of agent-based modeling as something you do in the social sciences or biology, but actually you can put, for example, physics or you know, chemistry or whatever, sort of harder sciences into it as well, and put physical rules into it. OK, so let's take one last break. And then when we come back, we're going to cover our final component, which is about techniques for augmenting data when you already are starting with a data set. Uh, so let's uh, let's reconvene at say 11:20. Okay, folks. So the last the last slog through the material. Thanks so much for bearing with me. Uh, now we're going to talk a bit. You know, simulate, generate. I guess I view this as more generate, right? Like you have some data. How can you get more data when you need more data?
um, especially if you uh, work with machine learning and even more so with neural networks. The more data, the better, right? And um, it often turns out that even synthetic data, if you do it right, can actually tremendously improve your model. So augmenting data sets. Uh, many reasons you might want to do this. These are just, you know, three that uh, tend to be fairly present in the real world and people run into all the time. Uh, firstly, many algorithms do not perform well, for example, on unbalanced data sets, right? Um, so you can augment your data to balance out your data set in such a case, right? If you can't augment your data and you want a balanced data set, uh, your options are not super appealing, right? You have the option of just oversampling existing data points. For many algorithms, that will not do anything because you're just providing redundant information. You're just sort of weighing it more. Uh, you could change your cost function. That's sort of the same as oversampling, so it doesn't always accomplish very much. Or you can cut down on your more dominant class, and that's super unappealing, right? To, when you're lacking data, why in the world would you throw out data, right? You certainly don't want to do that. Uh, so to the extent that you can find ways to balance a data set, create new helpful data, that's really good. Uh, another th reason you want to augment data sets, especially for neural networks. Neural networks are especially data hungry, and they improve their performance dramatically with augmented data. Um, I'm particularly thinking of the case of image analysis, right, where you learn data augmentation almost as soon as you learn how to do any image analysis with a neural network because it is so helpful um, in improving your model performance. So you can think of this, especially in a neural network case, as a way to build in priors by introducing examples of how data can be modified but should have the same outcome. And we'll, we'll get to a slide where uh, we look at this, for example, with neural networks and imaging. And then finally, a third major reason you would might possibly be looking to augment your data, even if you have tons of data, is sort of privacy, ethical, legal restrictions on real world data. Uh, so people who work in the health field, for example, are quite used to having extremely restricted data. And this can be uh, quite a challenge because on the one hand, you'd love to release your data uh, to the whole world or at least to some very savvy pharmaceutical company and say, hey, I have had 100,000 cancer patients. Why don't you take a look at this and let's cure cancer already, uh, which sounds great, except on the other hand, we don't want doctors doing things like leaking someone's HIV status, right? Which is how we ended up with these really restrictive health data laws, which seem very sensible. They just now are sort of running up against this whole, uh, you know, information revolution or whatever. So people are looking at ways of how can we release data, but also respect privacy and our legal obligations. Now, in the past, people have said, well, you know, you can just do things like remove the names and the DOBs and you should be fine. Uh, there's two problems with that, right? One is that sometimes you wonder if you are removing structure from that data that would be interesting, right? Sometimes privacy compromising information is also really helpful, right? For example, if I remove the names and addresses and dates of birth of my patients, I might, for example, miss the discovery of a cancer cluster that has to do with a certain town at a certain, you know, a certain decade. And so it's really a shame that I'd be missing that information. Uh, so I don't want to sort of remove that structure. And on the other hand, it turns out that even though you're removing structure, often you still have privacy leaks. So if you work in sort of a sensitive field like this, you're probably well aware of this, that you can easily violate someone's privacy having no intention to, because it turns out that you might release data that you think is de-identified, you think you took everything away, but if people have just a little bit of information about where your data came from and they have some other database, they can very often sort of join results. And this has been really embarrassing in a number of cases. Uh, for example, it turns out that some sort of fully sequenced DNA of human beings, their entire genome was released for researchers with the assumption that it's fully private. Uh, when this was released in the 90s, it was fully private. The problem is, is that some of these people who had their genome sequenced had cousins who did 23andMe or some of these other consumer, uh, consumer websites. Some of those have data that has gotten out into the public purposely or not, and people were able to match that up. So next thing you know, John Doe, we actually literally know his entire DNA sequence. I mean, talk about not having any privacy. Uh, so these things happen accidentally one way or another. To the extent that you can figure out methods to generate completely fake data that don't have data leaks, that's going to be amazing for not having to worry about this anymore. Now that said, of course, you're never going to be 100% sure, just like everything. You have to make sure you don't have the data leaks. So the problem is transformed, but it's still the same problem of making sure as you make synthetic data that you're not actually leaking real private data. So those are sort of three augmenting data sets motivations. Uh, so the first technique, we're going to cover uh, sort of two case studies, and there are many more. We can't cover them all. But the, 
First case I want to talk about is balancing data sets using SMOTE. So this was developed uh, 15, 20 years ago, but it continues to be very useful for the case of having data to classify where it is very imbalanced. So researchers have noted, as I mentioned, that things like simply oversampling with replacement of existing minority class data points did not improve model performance, right? Just by looking at the same few examples over and over again, your model doesn't get better, right? That's no different from sort of changing your cost function. You can do that, but it's got some limits. So they had the idea of generating synthetic data points by joining nearest neighbors of the same class and finding a way to project data onto those lines. So for example, um, if we look here, this is a plot from the paper, but say like uh, you can see the red dots are the minority class. So basically you would find two dots, nearest neighbors, you would connect them, and then in that feature space you would project to some random point between these two points, and that would be your new synthetic data. So obviously there are assumptions built into this, right? You're assuming that there is some sort of cluster structure underlying this, that the points between these class members are meaningful, right? If that doesn't describe your data, of course, you're not going to get better performance. But if it does, this can be a way to enhance your data that is not particularly computationally taxing and that's fairly transparent. Uh, so how do they do this? You basically look at your k nearest neighbors depending on how many points you're looking to oversample by. For example, if you wanted to oversample by 300% for some class, right, you want to get 3x the amount of data you have now, in addition, new data, you're going to draw a line between a data point and its three nearest neighbors, and then sample once along each of those lines. So that's also really nice because you're getting sort of a spread, right, you're not just relying on one nearest neighbor, you're introducing more variation in your selection, um, and this is, a, this is a way of building in those priors about the clustering. So let's go ahead and take a look at what this looks like. If we go to the notebook, this is the augmenting data notebook. So this uses a library called IMB Learn, Imbalanced Learning. So uh, you can pip install that or you can grab that from the GitHub. It's also a fairly lightweight library. Okay. So we're going to look at this on two data sets to just sort of get an idea of what it looks like. So the first data set uh, I'm using comes from the UCI uh, machine learning database, and it's a, a data set that's related to contraceptive methodology. So if we take a look at this, we've got a bunch of data about a bunch of married women, I forget in what country, uh, but what we see is we see that the sort of the choice of contraception is not uniformly even, right? We've got sort of three kinds, and one of them is about half of the dominant class. So we've, it's, you know, it's about 22% of the total. Uh, that's not wildly imbalanced, but I do worry, right, especially if I have some particular reason for wanting to identify uh, contraceptive use and get that really accurate. So one thing I can do is I can use a SMOTE object like this. I instantiate my object. And if we take a look at this object, we can see exactly... Um, what it's going to do, it's going to use a certain number of neighbors, namely five. We can set a random state and a sampling strategy. So first we're going to just generate our normal train and test data. If we do that and look at our test, we get one, two, three. And our test data, as I mentioned, was imbalanced, right? Just like our original data was imbalanced, our test data is imbalanced too. So let's go ahead and train a classifier. If we train a classifier on this, we're scoring at about 51% accuracy. Not great. I don't, you know, having no prior on this data, I don't know how good that is relative to uh, optimum. But I can look at my confusion matrix, especially for this second class, right, which is the least represented. Um, and only about 35% of uh, the elements of that contraceptive kind are actually being classified correctly. So that seems especially poor, right? That's notably poor even relative to the overall accuracy. So one thing I can ask is, well, what if I resample this with this SMOTE technique, right? What if I upsample to get more of these, which is as simple as taking this SMOTE object, fitting a sample of training data like this. And if I do that, let's first check what kind of shape I got, right? So first, what was my original training shape? was 986, 
and after smote, it's 1269, right? So I've gotten myself essentially almost 300 free data points. So the first thing I want to do is kick the tires and say, well, did I get any decent data points? Like, or, or did this, is this actually just a random number generator with no sense? Uh, so my first exercise for you is I would ask you uh, to examine the underlying distributions of the features pre and post smote and see if you can tell a difference. What do they look like? Does anybody find any problems? I did not either, but you know, there's, there's always a possibility that you might. Um, in this case, if we look at, for example, the distribution of the number of children, this is the SMOTE data set for the three different kinds of contraception. Uh, we notice that these histograms seem to have three characteristic shapes. And if we look at these shapes for the original data, they are really remarkably similar, right? Uh, it's interesting, even sort of the micro features are captured in this histogram. So at least if I'm looking at univariate distributions, I feel fairly confident that this oversampling has not distorted this distribution notably. That's already really nice compared to if I had, you know, sampled, sampled myself in some way I made up out of my head, I'm sure I wouldn't have gotten that right. So it seems like this underlying assumption of you can pick a point between two points and pick that too, and there's some sort of underlying cluster in this data seems reasonably true. Was there a question? Yeah, there's a question. Would this be kind of like a, um, like, 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 I, I think that's a good analogy, right? So the question was, is this in some way similar to um, blowing up or shrinking down an image? And, and what do you do to, to fill in those pixels? Um, and in some ways, I think it's analogous, right? At least when you're interpolating, there's the assumption that there's some kind of smooth underlying distribution. So that assumption is similar, yes, right? And that, that's just like with images, that's where it will do best. OK, so the, the only other thing I'd point out is we'd probably also want to look at the two-dimensional distributions, right? So here I'll just. I do a scatter plot of age versus number of children. Uh, so in this case, I didn't do one per group. I just colored them according to group. Uh, another quick way to do a visual check. So here we're looking at our pre-smote data. And here we're looking at our post-smote data. And again, it's, it's sort of remarkably similar, even sort of down to individual dots and what color they are. They look really similar. So we see uh, because of this sort of feature-motivated way of doing this, it also preserves those correlations between features really well. Um, that's interesting. Even when we revisit the idea, remember we looked at pi db gen and we thought, well, how can we just, you know, write some janky function to do age and credit score and make them correlated? Um, this could be another way to do that is we could imagine we just start with some baseline real data and the way to generate new data to have an even bigger pi db gen data frame would just be to sample with SMOTE or something like that to the extent that something like age and credit score is amenable to that. Now, that wouldn't work for names and phone numbers, but for those sort of numerical valuable var variables, it would. OK, so all we've, is, all we've determined so far is that SMO, it seems to leave our distributions undisturbed, which is what we want. We don't want to be introducing sort of new made up information into our data set. OK, so does SMO actually improve the model? Uh, well, oh, this is SMO. Uh, it seems to improve in the sense of we have a much more balanced data set now, right? It's exactly balanced. And let's see, how does our classifier do now? So now our accuracy is up to 0.529 as opposed to 0.5112. Uh, so it seems to do slightly better. Now, how much better that is um, is also partly stochastic, right? Because these are random forests, so you wouldn't necessarily want to draw a conclusion based on this alone. We might also want to look at the confusion matrix. And if we do that, we also see that the percentage of the minority class that are now correctly classified has gone up from 35% to 42%. To me, that's actually the more meaningful improvement, right? The accuracy bit, that might actually just be random noise. And if I run this enough times, maybe it's a wash. But at least the percentage of the minority class that are accurately classified has gone up. So when would I want to use this? Maybe especially if my minority class is the most important. And we can think of plenty of cases of that, right? For example, I hope it's the case in hospitals that most people 
are not sort of mortally injured. But I would also hope that my machine learning algorithm is best at identifying those people, right? Because they are the most crucial for that task. So something like that, where the cost of a minority misclassification is really costly and the thing that's most concerning to you is an example of where you'd want to use this. And as I was mentioning, this will do a lot better than just changing your cost function because you're providing genuinely new information to your algorithm. Okay, so as an exercise, I would ask you to repeat this with an even less balanced data set. So this is a bank marketing data set, also from the UCI archive. Uh, we'll just, uh, I provided the code to um, convert everything to numeric variables because a lot of it is in the shape of uh, categorical strings and such. But then I would ask you to run through, uh, run, run it through SMOTE and see if you think it actually improves the score in this case. So take a few minutes for that. Okay, so let's take a look at this one together. Uh, I use the same random forest classifier. In this case, I found that my confusion matrix indicated that I'm only classifying in my original model about 20% of the data properly. Um, that's not even doing so bad considering how imbalanced this data set is, right? We've got 40,000 no's versus only 5,000 yeses, so that's not actually that surprising. If we run it through SMOTE in this case, um, we now have more data. We score this, and actually we see that we take a huge hit in our accuracy, right? It's not like the last example where the accuracy was sort of the same, give or take. I've now gone from 80% uh, down to 70%. That's pretty terrible, right? Uh, and then what if I look at my confusion matrix on the other hand? I've gone from classifying just 20% of minority class, my minority class correctly, to classifying, let's see, 42% correctly. Uh, so this is one of these cases where it would require a lot of judgment and you'd really need to think about your institutional goals, right? So again, if I'm a hospital and I need to really find those minority of people who need urgent life-saving care, I'm probably going to go with this model, even though it means plenty of people with the common cold might, you know, something unpleasant will happen to them, but, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's not so bad. So this sort of technique and many sort of minority class oversampling techniques are appropriate for that. And you will sometimes take this accuracy hit, and that's where it's, you know, your discretion as a professional and your organization uh, has to think about how to do this. Okay. Um, we don't have time to take a look at the source code. I would encourage you to take a look on your own. Um, basically, I've highlighted here sort of with the pound sign where the work gets done. You can see you identify those nearest neighbors, and you just project somewhere along that line between a point and its nearest neighbors. It's actually in, in that feature space, right? So it's a really simple algorithm. The hard part is really just finding the nearest neighbors. That's a bit computationally taxing. Once you do that, it's just sort of like from me to the other class member sort of line of sight, cut it, and I'm good. OK, so that, that's an example of how you can oversample with data. There are obviously many other algorithms to do it, but this is a very standard, uh, widely adapted one uh, that tends to work well in this use case I've highlighted of increasing your uh, recall for your minority class. Okay, last, uh, last 20 minutes of this tutorial, and we are going to talk a little bit about data augmentation for neural networks. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, and uh, if you've done work with neural networks, for example, with image processing, you learn almost from the start that you want to augment your data. So what does that look like? Well, for images, what that looks like is you take an image and you think about what are other ways that that image might appear where a human would still readily identify it, right? So here we have a picture of a parrot, and we see some examples. So on the left, we have all sorts of examples of where we just rotated the image. So we take our data. We are not, there's no sort of imputation or underlying theory of the data the way there is with SMOT, where I have this assumption that the, the space between two class members is likely to be occupied also by those class members. Here, what we're doing is we're introspecting about the real world, right? How do I use a camera? How do I take pictures of objects? Or how do pictures, how do objects move around so that they appear differently? Uh, this is really nice because we can almost just sort of use our real world knowledge, basic stuff, to make our machine learning models easier. That doesn't usually happen, but it does for image analysis. So on the left, we have that. On the right, what we have are the sort of blurs we might 
do if we take a, you know, a really fast picture or we do something bad with our, our image processing. But that also happens in the real world, right? I'm, I'm taking a picture from my car and some aspect of it is blurred. Basically, anything we can think of that happens to an image that's some kind of mistake or some kind of change in how something presents itself that our eyes can still digest is something that we expect a neural network to be able to handle, right? So this is an example of we sort of introspect about the world and we can write all sorts of transformations that reflect the performance we expect. And luckily with neural networks, it just happens, right? And this is sort of wonderful that our neural networks get smarter. The more we sort of tell it, oh, you should expect all these different changes in data, uh, the smarter the network gets and the better performance we get. Um, we can also do other interesting with things with neural networks. So they don't just benefit from inputs where we augment. They can also themselves create augmented data or synthetic data that we can use for other models. Uh, so this is a paper I was mentioning to someone during a break. Uh, this is one of my favorite papers. I have no idea why. It's just such a really cool paper in a very important area where uh, researchers figured out how to make heterogeneous time series health data. Now this is, this sort of hits the ball right on the head for a number of reasons, right? First, this is data that, as I mentioned, it's really difficult to release because there are all sorts of privacy and legal issues, uh, which second means that it, we have this really important topic, right, healthcare, really serious things like cancer, or less serious but important things like how do we improve hospital administration, problems our society in particular is actively struggling with, unfortunately. Um, how can we make data available to more people to study this? And so one thing people realized is you could use this model of generative adversarial networks, which is when you have two models, one produces fake data, the other model tries to determine which is the fake data, which is the real data. You sort of race them against each other, and what you hopefully end up with is a model that's really good at generating fake data that looks very real. So in this case, and there have been other examples of this too, the researchers were able to refine a network sufficiently that it was producing heterogeneous time series data for healthcare. So heterogeneous meaning both things like numbers, like um, irregular measurements of blood pressure, but also things like qualitative assessments that might normally come from a physician's notes. And as you can imagine, these have all sorts of, of structure, right? It, these things all correlate with each other. So there's temporal structure, there's also cross-sectional structure. They were able to reproduce all of that in an extremely complex situation of healthcare. Um, and they were able to train then machine learning models on the synthetic data. And the machine learning models trained on the synthetic data did almost as well, but not quite as well as machine learning models trained on the real data, right? So this is pointing a way forward as far as respecting privacy, but also being able to make progress in this field. Uh, so neural networks benefit both from getting data, but then they can also produce data, which can either be used to train another neural network or some other sort of model. Um, you can also use your neural networks to uh, discipline, or you can use data to discipline neural networks so that they do even better than a human does, or they do better even in sort of unfair situations. So this was another recent paper that came out. Uh, and here the researchers said, well, why are we using synthetic data in just sort of the obvious ways of jittering images and rotating them? Yeah, sure, that's, that's fine, but we've sort of hit a wall. We want to get even better. We want our neural networks to be able to identify a car even when it's floating in space, right? Because a human can do that. We watch movies and see sort of improbable things and can still identify them. So how do you get a neural network to do it? You give it those sorts of improbable backgrounds. So once it's sort of trained up on reasonable real world data, you start throwing more challenging examples. Now, since those challenging examples are not naturally occurring, you augment your data set. But in this case, you augment it deliberately with pretty crappy data because you say, oh, now that you've been trained up on good data, I'm going to raise the bar, give you really bad data, and still expect good performance. So that's another way you can see data augmentation used with neural networks to really up, um, up the performance level of neural networks by sort of this two-tiered training of first good data and then deliberately bad augmented data. Um, so this is an example we're going to take a look at briefly uh, with fairly accessible code. Uh, this is a recent paper, Data Augmentation for Time Series, and in this case, uh, the researchers looked at wearable sensor data that was coming from people with Parkinson's disease, and they were looking to do various diagnostics with neural networks on this time series data, and they had the same question of, well, how can we augment our data? We have a limited set of data, a limited number of study participants, and so on, and what kind of... Um, Data augmentation actually works. And to some extent, right, once we get out of the visual analysis of images where we can sort of introspect about how our own brains work and have ideas, for things like time series, this is less obvious. So this is cases where people have to go out, do their research, and see what works. Uh, so we're going to see a few examples of how they computed 
data augmentation. So this is the last notebook, slide uh, notebook six. <coughs> okay, so we're gonna load the data which was downloaded from um, that study's GitHub which is also cited there, you can see it. If we look at the shape, they've actually only given us sort of um, three sample curves. So we're gonna think, well, what can we do with these sample curves? What would be some reasonable things to keep, preserve the nature of the time series but make it different enough that there are things to learn from? So the first thing they found was just adding jitter was a very useful augmentation strategy. So just take a minute and uh, code up that function to add some jitter to these time series. So if we do that, probably one of the easiest ways is to just go back to our roots, what we started this morning with, something like np.random.normal, right? Depending on what form of noise you want to add. In this case, they, they added Gaussian noise, but something you could ask experimentally is what if I use non-Gaussian noise? What if I use something that's uniformly sampled or sampled with some kind of skew? Does that also serve as productive data augmentation or does that tend to be kind of distracting? And you could contemplate, well, maybe that could be my second round, right? Just like we saw that research paper where first you use good images and then you start giving it more challenging augmented data, that's something you could explore here. Okay, another useful feature is sort of zooming in or out or time warping, where you sort of compress along your time axis in some portion and expand along your time axis in other portions, right? So if you do that, you need to do a few things. This is sort of multi-part. We're just going to walk through it together. Um, so first you need some kind of warping curve, some kind of way to describe the rate at which you're going to change your time axis. In this case, I have just made that a sine curve. So in this case, I'm going to make time pass quickly, quickly, and then slowly, slowly. Um, how do I relate this sine curve to my indices though, right? How do I now get this to that temporal axis? I have this function distort time steps where I basically I take the cumulative sum of these and I map this to my indices. So just like my indices are 3600, I make sure that the indices here go from 0 to 3600. But as you can see, there's a slight kink now, right? Like not all indices are represented equally. Some of them have been compressed and some of them have been expanded to get more or less coverage, right? I'm sort of adjusting my time. And you could make this really extreme by changing the values here, right? To be really strong compression, like five or 20 or whatever. And then you'd get really strange looking things. And that would sort of be an experimental question, right? How much can I get away with in terms of compressing or expanding time? Uh, we'll, we'll skip making this an exercise and we'll just go through it. So how do I distort this? Well, I can use the np.interpolation option, right? So that allows me to give uh, numpy my original series. I give it the indices and the way I wanted to interpolate, and then it will give me a new curve with my interpolated data where I've expanded and some deleted data where I've sort of contracted. And if we do this and plot the data versus the time warped data, um, I don't know about you, I certainly can't tell a difference visually, right? And that's probably a good first impression of what would be good data augmentation, right? Is if, if a human doesn't see the difference, hopefully that means that for our algorithm this would still be meaningful data. Um, but it is not the same data, right? So here if we plot a scatter of the warped data versus the data, this is where we sort of see the structure of that sine curve, right? There are these especially distorted points, and then we come back to the less distorted points, and then there's more distorted points, and we come back to the, the less distorted points. Uh, so point being here is that some of your data augmentation will look very simple. Others, you know, you can take uh, inspiration uh, from other fields. So for example, this was, ex this was inspired by dynamic time warping, which is a way that people measure similarity between time series. Uh, and they said, well, why don't we use that for data augmentation since that's something that makes sense to the human brain? Maybe that would also make sense to a neural network. Okay, uh, and then another exercise that I will leave as an exercise for the reader that they also found was useful was to permute chunks of the time series. So in that case, they found, okay, well, maybe the ordering of these things is not super important, and that makes sense if you think about it, right? I'm wearing a wearable. Maybe I stood here and then jumped, 
or maybe I jumped first and then stood here, and those should be sort of equally meaningful. So how do we express that prior to the network? We say, okay, we're gonna sort of take chunks and reorder them, and in a way that's giving a prior to our neural network that the ordering events is not so much important as the occurrence of the events, right? So if that makes sense for a particular set of data, we can do that. Okay, uh, so that's a wrap. I would uh, just like to briefly recap uh, just thinking about what we've done and thinking about where you can go from here. So just as a reminder, what I think is really cool is how much you can build up just from really the hard problem always is just how do you get the random numbers in the first place. And really everything after that is easy. So getting the random numbers is incredibly hard. Luckily that's basically a solved problem, especially because we're not cryptographers, we're data analysts, we're good to go. Um, once you do that, you can do all sorts of cool things, right? So what people do most of the time and you have most resources on is how do you simulate from sort of weird statistical distributions, right? Very computationally taxing, but kind of a solved problem. What are some problems that, that need a bit more solving and where maybe we can contribute something to the open source community? Something like simulating more human-oriented data, simulating things like names and street addresses, right? Um, that's interesting and challenging and remains under addressed. And then as far as sort of tools that you may not use but you might want to look into, uh, agent-based simulation does not get as much use in the sciences as maybe it should. And in fact, in many cases, you can take something that looks more like a traditional MCMC model, reframe it in an agent-based model, or vice versa, right? So be aware that just because you're using one paradigm, you should feel free to switch to other paradigms. Um, and then finally, augmenting data sets is an old science, but it's definitely getting a lot more play now with neural networks. So uh, there's a lot of research going into this. It's sort of an exploding area of expertise uh, and something where we're likely to see new developments. So I'd encourage you to keep following that, especially if you regularly use deep learning. Okay, so thank you everybody. If you have corrections or comments, I'd love to hear about those either on Slack or by email. And otherwise, I hope you have a great conference.